Okay, I'll get started. Ready? Okay. Call this regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, March 28th to order. Um, and I welcome our AEA representative, Ms. Linda Hansen, um, and our senior class person who will be giving his name very soon. We welcome you, even though we don't know your name yet. Eric Lee, Eric Lee thank you for coming. Um, and is there any, I don't see any, and there's no public participation. So we will start, actually, I'm jumping ahead because I have opening remarks this time. My name. What? Uh oh, we got props. Yeah. Uh oh, it's another bag. Oh, not this again. No, this is me. Oh. I'll do this one. Yeah, <laughs> listen to rolling the eyes and stuff. Okay. So I'm not usually a big talker, and I don't usually do big acknowledge all your team. Uh, I try to show you I appreciate you by listening to what you have to say, by respecting what you have to say, and trying to f understand it. Um, but given that this is my last meeting of chair, uh, I also wanted to touch on some of the lessons I've learned from all of you, and I think of it as providing a foundation. So, uh, from Cindy, thank you for starting the governance project. <laughs> and also, I learned the value of sending a letter that the recipient felt was a little bit off the mark, and how it garnered a whole lot more attention from the uh, Department of Education than I think if we had just written something, you know, spot on and stuff. They were much more interested and responsive to it, which I thought was kind of funny. Um, from Jeff, who is not here, but I'll keep going. Um, I learned the value of experience on the committee and the extremely useful refrain of kick it to a subcommittee. <laughs> <laughs> so that builds Policy. a little bit more. From Paul. I found out about unexpected answers to questions, and also uh, someone who knows an awful lot more about numbers than I do. <laughs> and from Bill, respectful dissension while trying to hold to your point of view. And from both Bill and Liba, the benefit of your teacher and administrative experience. And you can see we're getting something. I didn't time this out. From Liba, the value of creating a community committee to address an issue and how that snowballed into the kindergarten tuition being eliminated, which was a pretty, and, and we get more money. And, you know, it's kind of a total win-win. And then from Mr. Pierce, the value of a well-written policy and also the value of a very helpful vice chair. And I appreciate everything you've done, being willing to dive in if you're confronted with unexpected things, even if you're rightfully concerned that maybe I'm going to make, there's going to be a laugh at the end of it. But, um, and I'm not trying to ignore the rest of the team, which is the administration. I appreciate all of you, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing. You guys are the roof. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thank you. and of oh, course, so I have to quote, this yes, this, yeah, I, you'll notice I hired out some of the, uh, yeah. yeah, the artwork there. Yeah. 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 Sub that out. Yeah. <laughs> so. I have to close with, and since I've had one or two times, so I skipped ones, we get two quotes tonight. So from Henry Ford, coming together is a beginning, keeping together is progress, working together is success. And from a poster somewhere, teamwork is the ability to work as a group toward a common vision, even if that vision becomes extremely blurry. I think that kind of defines school committee. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. <laughs> so, and with that, we've already discussed the art last time, and we have no. Okay, so now we move on to approval of the trip to Beijing. And we have um, Catherine Ritz, who is the director of World Language Department here tonight, to talk about the uh, about the trip. Hello. Um, I trust you all received the information sheets. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if you have any questions. We, this is um, the extension of, I know a lot of you hosted this past year at your homes, um, some of our Chinese visitors from Beijing, and we want to continue our relationship with them through a two-way exchange next year. Um, so I will be the primary chaper chaperone along with the teacher from the middle school. We um, hope to welcome the students again as we did in February and then travel to Beijing over April vacation. 
Um, so I don't know if you want me to go into more detail or if you have other specific questions. Mr. Hanna? How many are currently going? I have not uh, begun to enroll students. Um, okay. I'm, a, I'm a little concerned if it reaches the top number that there's only two adults going. If it does go above 30, we'll have a third chaperone included. Um, I, guess, I, I would be very surprised, but yes. I guess my concern is a 15 to 1 ratio with high school students. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much they've changed since I was in the high school, but that... Uh, I mean, well, with the France Exchange, we have, I think we have 24 students, and it, there's two chaperones, so um, it's not too unusual. Um, I would prefer not to have 30 students as well, but I don't think, I would be very surprised if we hit that number. but. If we go above it, we'll have a third chaperone. And just one more. Uh, are there any provisions for scholarships? No, and that is something I would like to look into for future years for the entire, as we're, one of my goals in the department has been to increase our trips um, and exchanges, and I think we do need to seriously look into that, um, going, you know, having something. But at this time, no, but it's, I think, something we need to make a goal for. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Ms. Starks? Um, I actually was part of the Japanese, one of the Japanese exchange programs a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, and there were only three of us, and it was middle school and high school kids, um, and it was fine. Mm -hmm. They were mm -hmm. they were great, and actually, when you get there, there were so many other yeah. people, mm -hmm. so many other adults who were there to kind of help mm -hmm. see us around. That right. the it, mm -hmm. they easily doubled as many chaperones as mm -hmm. we had, and then. There was always some tour guide, so there was always a lot of mm -hmm. adults. So yeah. I, I'm not I'm not concerned at all about that. I really like the fact that they are going to um, stay in the homes. Mm -hmm. I feel like that is such a great part of these kinds okay. of exchanges. You learn so much in those hours where you're just sitting around and what you see in their houses and how that everyday life is different mm -hmm. than just you know visiting the sites yeah. which are beautiful as well and I, I'm excited that they're going but mm -hmm. um, I, I this it looks awesome I hope you guys yeah, have a great I hope time. it'll be good thank you anyone else no? I had the same question about mm -hmm. scholarships from mr. Hainer had asked it thank mm -hmm. you. Um, <coughs> okay uh, all right so the <coughs> since this is a um, trip beyond the borders of Massachusetts uh, we need your approval uh, for this uh, trip and did not want to begin advertising it with, for students until the, the school committee acted on it. Okay. Motion to approve the Beijing Arlington Exchange um, proposal dated April 17th to 20, April 27th, 2014. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And, okay. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great trip. Thank you. Okay. At this point, we move on to the monthly financial update. Ms. Johnson. Thank you. Um, as of the end of February, which is the reports I'm reporting on, um, we are tracking slightly under budget. Right now, the deadline for general fund expenditure submissions is April 12th. And I've just run another set of reports for the administrators, but I didn't have time. I wanted to get all the POs in that I had, so I didn't have time to get those reports to you tonight. Um, you'll be getting those reports after I come back from vacation. And in fact, I'll probably run fresh reports with the updated information later in April. Um, but at that point, that'll be it for the um, administrators spending their budgets. And then at that point, we'll reconsolidate and see where we stand and start making projections towards the end of the year. At present, we only have utility bills through the end of January, and I'd like to see February and March on the books before I start making estimations about where we'll end with fuel charges for the year. Mm -hmm. Does any <coughs> questions? Does anyone, Mr. Hainer? Who do we rent the PS field to? I keep seeing that showing up, and it's the same number. He said, he, 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 I think it was in the, one of the accounts, PS field, and it said uh, 20 or $22,000. That's the budgeted amount we expect to spend out of the revolving, but the amount that we've actually brought in on the Pierce Field is in the revolving revenues report. And so far, as of February 28th, we have brought in $11,438. Okay. I guess it's not the numbers. Who do we actually rent it to? A variety of different groups. I can't tell you right off the top of my head. That's handled typically by the athletic director and Paula Neville in my office. Okay, thank you. Any, any other questions? 
Okay, I had a couple of questions. Um, first, on the building rental on the last page, mm -hmm. um, it says revenues received as of February 28th, and it's 131,000, $131, and the estimate was 350. And I'm wondering this late in the year if that's it's okay. So that's actually on track because I'm thinking yes. a lot of the year is we have um, several of our long-running programs uh, pay at the end of the year. Ah. Okay. Um, and then the second thing, this is uh, partly for Ms. Starks. My recollection is that the, sorry, I okay. should have talked to you before. <laughs> um, my recollection is that the budget subcommittee made a list of things that you hope would be bought, purchased if there was any monies left over. Yes, we made a priority yes. list. Absolutely. And I'm just bringing that to your attention because I think the first thing on that list was curriculum. Yes. Um, and that's, I just want to be sure that we remember that that list is out there. Thank you. Okay. Anything, any further, Mr. Pierce? Well, has, has this year taught you or given you any guidance in terms of budgeting for next year? And what, what types of lessons did FY13 give you in your preparations for FY14? Well, that's the tricky thing about budgeting because we start the process so early. The current year doesn't tell me much. It's really the year before because that's where I have 12 months worth of data. Mm -hmm. So I look m much more closely at 11 and 12 to make 14 than I do at 13. Interesting. Okay. So, you know, it's kind of a two-year process. Right. Well, then my question goes then to F Back to 11 and 12. <laughs> right. Um, what, what types of things did you assess from, from that complete year that aided you in well, a couple of things. We're trying to um, develop a m more finer granulated budget. Mm -hmm. So the budget in FY10 was in big lumpy categories, and I'm trying to break it out. But it's impossible to determine what you're going to spend in little line items if you haven't had them before. Mm -hmm. So I've been using 11 and 12 to expense the data. The mm -hmm. budget was still fairly aggregated, but the expenses were more detailed. And so as each year goes on, I can refine that further. I can look at, and as I have more years of data, I can see that some line items you know, most line items are going to run at a certain rate, and some are going to be fluky, and some are going to be one-offs. That, you know, that line got expensed once and hasn't been expensed in three more years. So, you know, you, that's how you start crafting your budget, and you refine it down and down to the point where you're budgeting in sensible levels of detail, not crazy levels of detail, and, and that's kind of a, a fluid thing. I mean, this is the first year with FY14 that I decided to stop spreading out maintenance budget and re-aggregate it back in facilities because what you're going to, you know, the boiler isn't going to break every year for the same amount of money in the same school. And so trying to spread it out that way doesn't make any sense. Mm. But on the other hand, schools tend to spend about the same in paper, toner, and ink over a period of time. So that is one that is really good to watch. And after two, two years of actuals, you're starting to get a picture. Typically in budgeting, you want three years of actuals and then a year of projection. That's what the ASBO, the National Organization for School Business Officials, recommends. Three years of actuals, a year with projections, and then your budget year. And that's what I've been building towards since FY11. So I'm getting closer. Great. Thank you. Anything, any further questions? No? Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Um, and next, the FY budget, an update on the FY budget presentation to the Finance Committee. Dr. Bode. Thank you. Thank you to those of you who were able to make it. I know some of you had um, conflicts that evening. Uh, we did present uh, the FY14 budget to the Finance Committee last Wednesday. Um, and we were, we were in discussion with them for s several hours, actually. Um, what you have at your place, for those of you that did not see it, but I think you maybe have had this even earlier, this was um, our, just sort of the slides that we presented to the Finance Committee, just give them an overview of the FY14 budget. There's no information in here that you haven't seen or we've talked about before. Um, when I, when we, I think about that evening in terms of the budget and what was the focus of the Finance Committee, the bulk of the discussion, which was actually quite lively and, 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 and hopefully informative for the uh, Finance Committee, was around special education. Um, they had, there was some concern about uh, the issue of the growth of special education, uh, the growth of educa special education in this year and the projected growth for next year, 
and we talk, we were able to talk about it over multi years. Um, because of that discussion, there was an amendment that was put forward by uh, a member of the committee uh, to reduce the school budget by nearly 500,000. And there was some discussion around that. Uh, that amendment did not pass. And the, the Finance Committee did vote approval, uh, I should say, to recommend our budget to the uh, town meeting uh, later this spring. In addition to discussing special education, we talked in general about um, just uh, education that's going on in the public schools today and also about the medical program. But I would say really the bulk of the evening was talking about special education <laughs> and, uh, and because there has been this question about um, what our budget shows for next year regarding the increase in special education, um, I asked Diane if she would um, go take another look at how to look at the budget um, in terms of growth over multiple years and how and how we are projecting for FY14. And so she had a few slides tonight um, that we, just taking another, uh, just a, another lens at the whole issue. And it might be something that uh, the committee might suggest that we uh, potentially share with the, the Finance Committee and, and potentially share at a town meeting when we project, when we present our budget. Do we have a copy of this too? It's in uh, orange. You do. Mm -hmm. It was you. on your chair. Okay. One of, the first, one of the first questions that arises is what are special education costs? And in our budget, special education costs are costs that directly support children on an individual education plan or an IEP. So this is teachers, related service providers, OT, PT, speech, um, psychologists, social workers, teaching assistants, the people that directly work with special needs children. It also includes <coughs> transportation, out of district tuition, expenses that are directly in the service of special ed. The other thing that's, that is included in our special education costs are costs that support the administration of IEPs, and that would be the special education administration and their staff who actually work the paperwork. That definition of special education pretty much tracks with the state um, end of year report and how they define special education costs. I think the um, important thing to bear in mind about special education costs is when they're defined this narrowly, it's important to think about them as separate for the rest of the budget because in fiscal hard times, those are not costs that we can cut. Those are all driven by IEPs and we're required to maintain those services. We can sometimes restructure within the context of IEPs as we have done this year by increasing related service providers and decreasing the number of teaching assistants. But special education costs as defined by this are not things that we can, that we can cut easily or often. One of the things that's important to remember about special education costs is because we don't have the power to cut them, they can grow in irregular and sometimes alarming rates based on the needs of the individual IEPs. As this slide says, when school appropriation doesn't take that into account, special education cost growth can really cut into regular education cost growth because special education costs are mandated, regular education costs are not to the same extent. And as regular education um, loses resources, parents are incentivized to seek special education placements for their children when they struggle. And this leads to the destructive cycle. I apologize to those of you who remember this from years ago. I, I have recycled it for tonight. But basically, this talks about what happens when special education cost growth starts eroding regular education. Differentiated instruction, response to intervention programs like literacy and math intervention, those are the things that tend to get eaten up, which in turn increases referrals to SPED, which increases eligibility findings, which grows special ed cost growth, grows special ed costs, and further reduces resources to regular education. So it is very much a destructive cycle that you don't want to be in. What's not included in the way we're looking at special education costs are district-wide professional development, 
um, department and school-based leadership in academic content areas, district-wide administration, and the response to intervention, particularly our, our rich literacy program and our growing math RTI program. When you consider that 25% of our teachers and 15% of our students are part of special education, by extension, anywhere from 15 to 25% of all of these costs could also be considered special ed costs because obviously the cost of educating special needs students isn't just the cost we count as special ed. We want a quality education for all of our students. Inclusion practices you know, allow teachers to be more skilled in differentiating instruction, and that doesn't just benefit special needs children, it also be benefits regular needs children. As we've spoken many times before, the response to intervention models in literacy and, hope, and as we develop in mathematics are going to help our struggling students without the need for special education identification. <coughs> This helps to keep our special ed costs down by making sure all children are getting the support they need without needing to resort to a special determination of special ed. This is the constructive cycle that we're working towards. We have strong differentiated instruction, reducing referrals to SPED, fewer eligibility findings, SPED costs better controlled, and more resources to regular education. So essentially, when we look at the FY14, budget, this is what's going on. We've been doing a good job with our interventions. We're holding our numbers. Our numbers in special education are, are, lower, are coming down a little bit. Our special ed costs are flattening out. And this is all very desirable. And, and we, because of this, we're able to reinvest in the response to interventions that we need to continue this trend. When we look at the history of special education costs in Arlington, I, I was trying to come up with ways to, to show what's going on as best I can because it is complex and volatile. In this particular graph, starting with FY05, the dark blue line is our, our special education costs from the end of the year report through FY12. The FY13 amount is estimated for this year and it's the FY14 budget at the end. That shows what our actual growth has been over this period of time. The top line shows, starting with the, what we spent in FY05, where we would be if costs had grown at 10% annually. The yellow line is a 7% growth curve, and the bottom line in pink is a 3.5% growth curve. So as you can see, in the early years, um, special ed costs were growing faster than 10% which is, you know, if they had continued to do so, you can see our costs would be up, you know, getting close to $25 million, which is pretty scary. Instead, you see that there's been changes, um, and this is through several administrations and changes of staff, but you can see that by and large, we're bringing, we're bringing those costs more in line with 7%. I also took a look at the same idea, but starting in FY11, which is the beginning of the recent long-term plan. And so we see that going into FY12, which is the first year of the override, our costs exceeded, our cost growth exceeded 10%, um, 7%, and three, you know, 3.5%. And in fact, it isn't until the FY14 budget that our special education costs are coming in below 10%. So when you consider it in this light, you know, 7% over time is not an unrealistic estimation of our costs, given their volatility and given what we're doing. And so that, I think, is the important takeaway from all of this, is that while for this particular budget, for FY14, we are slightly below 7%, and certainly if we look at it in isolation from 13 to 14, there isn't 7% growth over those two years. If you look at the long term, both in terms of longer history and shorter history, the 7% is still a reasonable funding model for our special education costs. And by funding it at 7%, it allows us to continue to maintain strong regular education services to not get back into the destructive cycle where, where special education is eating the heart out of regular ed. Questions? Anyone have any questions? I have a comment. Oh. Okay, Mr. Hainer. Is it the intent to to present this to town meeting or just have it available ready to be, or? I think this is something we would like to have your um, input. I, 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 given the level of questioning that we received, I wish we had uh, put Do this presentation together. Do we know if the, if the finance committee is, 
if a minority report may be planned? I don't know. I have no idea. No, they, they just, uh, yeah. Ms. Hine? Um, Ms. Johnson, I want to ask about the 504 costs. Um, do they overlap with our special ed costs or are they kept distinct as well? They are distinct. I count them in with our special ed costs, but they're, they're relatively not large in Arlington. Okay. Mr. Schlickman? First of all, having been at the meeting, I want to thank uh, Ms. Johnson for her very articulate uh, explanation to the Finance Committee. She uh, really brought an educator's view to, to the question, and, and it showed a depth of knowledge that, that I thought was commendable. Uh, the issue here is, is twofold. I think that one of the things that we've been very priding ourselves in is the transparency of our budget process. And that Ms. Johnson has been very diligent in terms of breaking out costs and trying to assign them both in a transparent and a consistent manner. Um, <clears throat> special ed is costly, and we don't necessarily tag every expense that could be tagged as a special ed expense in that bucket. Because, for example, if we're doing professional development for all our teachers, uh, we're not tagging the professional development costs of special ed teachers as a special ed cost. Uh, and if we were to quote uh, Bloom to Bialystock, or it was Bialystock to Bloom, uh, you're an accountant, you can move the decimals. We could move the decimals e every year to bring this number in at, at 7% and do it in a legitimate manner. But in our efforts to be transparent of what we're doing uh, to uh, try to service special ed students through an RTI model which involves the use of regular education teachers, it appeared that we weren't growing at 7%. And that's what became the target. You didn't grow 7%, we're going to take that money away from you. Which might have been valid if we were at 8% and they would have given us more money to, uh, to make up the difference. But we, we can't be playing a uh, heads you win, tails you, head, heads I win, tails you lose kind of deal where the reward for frank and honest budget presentations is to have our uh, budget come under attack. And, and I think that we have a very defensible budget. We're both doing the right thing fiscally and the right thing for kids. And, and I think that we would have tremendous support on the floor of town meeting, and I think you've got seven school committee members in this room who are articulate spokespeople for this and, and, and will be able to go and defend it if it comes to that. I would just add, Ms. Johnson, the destructive, the destructive cycle, the word, I, I wouldn't use that word because I, I don't think to many um, parents um, it's, it's useful. So. Well, this is actually a rerun from town meeting in FY11, so this has already gone to the floor. Yeah, and then I'm, then I'm railing against that slide. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to, I mean, I, I, I see what you're getting at, I see what your point is, but perhaps using some different type of description for it, it I think is, is more appropriate here. Um, I, would, I would chime in on what Mr. Pierce said, that I know we've used, seen this before, and thinking about it, I think you're saying it's destructive to budgets. But the problem is that at mm -hmm. this point, seeing it again, it makes me think destructive to children and, mm -hmm. or, or something. It's just not a good association. So if we can come up with something else. Mm -hmm. Another way of um, describing yes. it. Uh, Ms. Hansen? I was just going to say, how about counterproductive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as an alternative that possibility? OK, Mr. Hainer. I'd rather show the, the constructive one and go in a positive vein, the one that you showed what we're trying to do this year, and present that one. Uh, it's, it's the antithesis of this, and uh, I think that would be better received. It, it basically shows what we are doing and why, we are, why the numbers came the way they came. And we're doing a positive job in education. We're, we're doing what everybody wants us to do. And uh, I see this as, as a promo. I agree with Mr. Schlickman. I think during the debates in the past when there has been special education pitted against general education and issues like that, there have been a, quite a few people 
coming forth mm -hmm. on the floor and coming out with a positive thing. I, I just see this as a positive way of looking at it. Um, we can change that for sure. One of the things that you, I just want to follow up on your comment, it, it is very positive and we have been moving in the district to having that line between general education and special education blur completely. And that I think is a trend that's going to continue. So it's not um, it, disingenuous to say that the cost of curriculum leaders has an effect on special education because more than ever they are involved with special education teachers doing professional development, supporting them in the content. But I'd like to go back, uh, uh, Diane, for a second to the one, the slide, um, I think it was your very first slide, because I want to make a comment about, about this. When we first began talking about what would be a sustainable number in long-range planning for special education. Well, first of all, even before that, should we break it out? Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of disagreement on that, and I think that, uh, that my strong position, as well as the members of the school committee that participated, was that yes, we should, because that particular part of the budget was, is so volatile and affects um, general education uh, so significantly. But the thing that I want to point out is, in this particular graph, is that when we first began talking about what would be a sustainable number, we were looking at a 10-year history of what special education costs had been at one point, and we were looking at 10%. Mm -hmm. And our goal has been to reduce that um, all, every year and, and reduce it by, while at the same time improving delivery of special education services. And I think that we've been able to do that through our programming, through RTI, um, through much more of, a, as I said, a blurring be, between uh, special education, general education in terms of content, professional development. So there's, no, there's a, a whole number of things that we've been doing as a district to reduce the rate of growth. But I think that we're also, even with the reduction <laughs> in the rate of growth, are truly offering a much better product, much better services than we did even a couple years ago. <coughs> and I suspect that in the years ahead we will. When we start looking, um, you know, each year we do an analysis of multiple years, maybe we'll stick with this, you know, a, a same number. I think this last one was nine years, wasn't it, Diane? Um, it's, this is actually 10. This one's 10, but to keep, that window of 10 is gonna keep shifting, obviously, with each year to be able to see that that rate of growth is coming down is exactly what we want to see as a school community and certainly as a community in Arlington. So I, I feel actually very pleased that it may be dipping a little bit below for 14. Now that's projections, and I, and I really emphasize that that's projections because this was all uh, created before we even knew what, what might be some recommendations for placements going into next year, and I already know there's placements. So those are not captured in these projections. And so at the end of next year, it may be that while we had hoped to be able to sort of dip below slightly under the 7%, that may not be the actuals of the situation. Um, but that's the, what we would hope to have happen. Now, as you can see from this graph, and we've had other ones in the past, it's so volatile that um, it, it's, you have to look at it over multiple years because any one year is not a true picture of what's going on. And uh, so I, I, hopefully this is um, helpful in understanding that. But the, the other part that's really important to notice in this graph is the purple line. If we were to keep special education costs rising at 3.5%, which is what we're doing with the rest of our budget, you can see what would happen. But what happened for many years is that um, we have, we're mandated to expend these monies, and um, it's at other costs in the budget. So hopefully this is helpful, and I, for people who are listening, maybe um, helpful as well, and you know, get, getting your advice in terms of our presentation to town meeting would be 
good to know what you think about whether we, we actually have this in our presentation or just wait on questions. Okay. Did you have, oh, sorry, Mr. Thielman. So the, the, the cycle question, the, the important thing to understand is the destructive cycle was the old way of doing business in this community not that long ago, five, six, seven years ago, I don't know, maybe I'm not running, but not that long ago, that was, that was the old way of doing business and the constructive cycle is the way we've been doing it in recent years, under the past several years. So that's the important thing to point out, however we phrase it. And that's the important thing to celebrate. We've developed a new way to approach special education that's helping more kids and keeping our costs down. And that's something that we have to celebrate. And we're, and we're, I think, we're always trying to improve. We're trying to get better and better and better all the time. That's, the, that's our philosophy, that's our approach. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So I just wanted, can you, Dr. Bodie, repeat the question that you're asking for us? Because I'm not sure we've actually answered it. Well, maybe we can bring this to the budget subcommittee before we present uh, our budget to town meeting, whether you would want to include this, and maybe Mr. Fanning can also give us some feedback on that. Uh, I knew there was gonna be questions about special education, but I was a, a little bit of surprised that it really was the dominant conversation that evening. And so if, if, since that's the case, uh, this may be something that's important to present as part of our budget presentation. Do you want a formal motion or are you just? No, um, we'll it take okay. it up, that'd be great. Okay. 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 I just wanted to make a couple comments too. Um, first, I like the graphs. Uh, I wonder if we'd want to include a graph of the, the way the percent increases or decreases fluctuate from year to year. You know, it's like this and that and that. Um, and I also wanted to note that as we're moving into more students in inclusion classrooms, to me, it seems like that's also kind of muddying the waters because how do you assess the cost of the, you know, how, how do you put a value on the teacher? It's not just the special education support person, even though we've doubled them, it's also the classroom teacher there. And so that's something else which I think pretty well muddies these waters and is something we should think about. Um, any further thoughts or comments, or we'll wait until budget subcommittee thinks about it. Okay, cool. Great, thank you. Will do. Um, and at this, we move on to an update on the Thompson. The, um, the, the Thompson is moving along quite well. Um, next week we have our monthly Thompson School Building Committee meeting which will actually be able to give you a much better picture at the April 11th meeting but right now um, there has been a focus on uh, some change orders and um, there's also the possibility of, of some uh, potential fundraising for the Thompson PTO but I can tell you more about that at the next meeting Otherwise, there's really not much to report at this point other than from what I've been reading from the construction reports, we remain um, on schedule and no, no major deviations. Okay. I don't know, Diane, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, we'll get a complete report next week. Mr. Hainer. When are we going to go visit? <laughs> <laughs> when you're ready, I'm, I'm just... I, I talked to our, our project manager about it. He knows that you want to visit, as does the Thompson School Building Committee. And he was suggesting that maybe a late April, early May would be the best. Right. It was still a lot, he was concerned that there's still a lot of wires and all that and stuff on the ground and didn't want to take a lot of people in quite yet. Just tell him I'm going to ask you every two weeks. Okay, <laughs> well, we're, you're definitely on the, uh, the planning. Um, can we have a motion to table the police until they arrive? So moved. And second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Um, would you like to have, go on to superintendent report or do you, okay. Let's do that. All right. Um, well, 
Let's talk about snow for a second. <laughs> <laughs> <That's not awesome. laughs> One of our favorite body. topics. Um, the last day of school is June 28th, and it is a Friday, and we can't go beyond that. Uh, so every time I hear that there is more snow approaching, I, I do listen with great care. Uh, but I think we may be out of the woods at this point, but one never knows. I think that, um, of course, the concern would be what would happen if we were to have another snow day or rain, you know, a hurricane day or whatever, because our two alternatives remaining would be vacation days during the April vacation. And then there comes a certain point when you can't plan that anymore. And um, we, may, we may be close to there right now. So that only leaves Saturdays after that. And I think that we're, what I'm hoping and certainly thinking positively about that, that uh, we will not have to, to go there. But the April 11th meeting would be the last time that we could make a vote about uh, school vacation. Be but even then, it's awfully late for people who've made plans. Mr. Hainer? Just as preventative, would it be appropriate, in your opinion, to do that now? and only use it in an absolute emergency? Because I, don't, mm -hmm. I think there's a concern, uh, from what I've heard, is that, that I'm not trying to put any blame, but part of the uh, couple of the days that were non-school days this year, uh, it can also be affected by having a school on a Saturday as well. Saturday may not be acceptable to a large portion of uh, population within the community as well. And that's, that's my concern uh, in that aspect. So I don't, I'm just putting this up for discussion, I guess, whether we, the 11th is awful short to inform well, the community it, that we're going to have a, I, even now maybe short. It may even be short right now because that's only two weeks away. That's right, two weeks away. I don't think it'll be necessary. I, I'm certainly hoping it's not going to be necessary. So I wouldn't, at this point, people have so many plans. Mm -hmm. uh, I just... It's just something that's out there. Um, I think April 11th is too late to do anything about that. I suspect that what we would have to do is to get through, um, put it later in the year. Now, there's always a chance that the governor might forgive some days. It's hard to say. But we're not the, we're not the only district in this position. Um, there are a number of districts who are going up to that last day, the 27th, 28th, but then there are some districts that are still back the week before, and the reason why they are is that there's, they're actually having students come before Labor Day. Mm -hmm. I heard Westminster's already planning a day during the April vacation. There's some districts that have, the, the, um, central Massachusetts and western Massachusetts have had more snow days or bad weather days than any other place in the Commonwealth. Fortunately for them, in many districts, they start the last week of August. So they have a little bit more give in their, their schedule. And then there's the other issue, too, is that um, even some of our neighboring districts that have a little bit more give, it's they, do not, um, they do not have days off on any of the religious holidays, including Good Friday. Uh, so there are a number of school districts around us that will have a half day tomorrow. Mr. Hainer. Real, real quick, when we initially started looking at this, I think it was brought forward that DESC recognizes 20 or 22 or 23 official religious days and recommends that they not be considered as a school day, but also the school is to recognize these individuals and not to penalize them as a... Uh, it would be considered an excused absence. And that's the ESE's right, because there's no way any school could recognize them all. <coughs> and I think as communities become more and more diverse, when we recognize some, there's going to be a desire to recognize more and more. So I would support what the superintendent uh, just stated. That At this point, the, the committee has already approved um, the calendar with the major rocks that are in at the the holidays, the start dates, that's all been approved. What's going to come to you probably, if not the next meeting, certainly by the end of April, 
um, a, com a completed calendar which will have the early release days on it, the conferences, the night conferences for next year so that everybody has a complete calendar uh, with all the dates on it before the end of the school year. In past years, we've waited to put conference days on until the fall, and that's just, it's just not, it, it, today when families have a lot more scheduling challenges, it's, it's much better to know ahead of time. And so that's what the plan will be. Our next calendar, uh, right now the way it is set up, we have only one additional snow days potential for next year, am I correct? We're up to the 26th or 27th of June? It's something like that, yes. But there, that next year it wraps around, I think the last day of June is on Monday. But we're up to with only about two days. With, when you add on the five that are required by state law, we're up to about two days from the potential last day of June. Can I ask a question about the requirements? Is there, do we have to have a certain amount of attendance at school? For it to be considered a legitimate day or is it just we offer school and who comes comes there is an attendance requirement and i just would have to look it up i don't know it off the top of my head okay minimum yeah so that would be a question i would my understanding is if and it goes to illnesses and stuff if a certain percentage is not present and it can be attributed to an illness the school is required to be closed i didn't know if it would that that the day could not be I thought as long as the school schools are open, opened, I could I'll Let me look into that. It. When I bring the calendar, I'll, I will double check that. I, I, I may be incorrect, but I'll, I'll double check that. That's my understanding, though. I think that's a question we would have. Yeah. Um, but partly, I'm not sure if we're ready to make a decision to call school on during April vacation if we were to have a. To, I'm saying sh shaking the head and no. Um, what happens if we don't do, if we came out 179 days? Are we, is our Chapter 70 money, is that the sort of Damocles they hold over us? I don't think we even have the option. I think we well, have I to mean, schedule. If, 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 let's say on May 4th, a hurricane hit. We have no days to, we'd then there, have to pull a Saturday? Oh, there are. I'll pull it out so you can see it. There actually are guidelines if when you have an emergency, say, in June, and I forget what the first day, it may be just June or maybe sometime in late May. When that happens, I do not think you have to make it up. But there, I, the, the governor sent out those regulations last year, and I will get a copy for you. Okay. Mr. Thelman. There, there's, always, there's always the option, depending if there is a storm, there's always the option of an emergency meeting of the school committee mm -hmm. if you had a recommendation for yeah. us. So yeah. we don't have to wait to the 11th yeah. of April. Yeah. Good point. That's you a very say, good point. You could yeah. say, the next day I want to have an emergency meeting. Kersey calls the meeting. We meet. You make a recommendation. We vote yes or no. Okay. That's, I, I like that answer. And actually, it gives us a chance to start talking to people about would you rather have that or a Saturday. Right. And we can find, if you can send us the information about how many people have to be present, because that, I think, factors into it. Because if we're not going to get enough attendance on a certain choice, then it yep. doesn't work anyway. Right. So, right. okay. Thank you. So, we'll just Good wait point. for your call Thank next you. week. Hey, I told you community experience. Just you were You weren't here. I said that you bring the, the com bring to the committee experience. And thank you. <laughs> show, them which, show them which logs. All right. Yeah. <laughs> you were right. winning. You were, you were winning. Yeah. These ones I was in here. traffic that on that. Built, oh, yeah. That's very nice. I'll, I'll go into another topic, which since it's earlier in the evening, I know there will be a lot of kindergarten families that are interested in this. Um, subsequent to the committee approving tools of the mind, um, we looked at the kind of professional development that was needed for teachers and needed to be done this year in order for the teachers to be to have the summer to prepare for the this change in our curriculum and as part of the the all of the professional development that will be necessary we need to do two training days in the end of the end of june so as you're aware, I sent a survey out not only to the kindergarten teachers but to kindergarten parents. Uh, 
unfortunately, there was a little bit of a snafu with the email getting out from Saturday. It was sent out on Saturday, but did not arrive until Tuesday, and I, I don't know why. But at any rate, we extended it, and we, I think we've had all of the kindergarten parents respond. In fact, we have more responses than we have children, um, which, which might be that there are you know, families that, that have joint custody. I mean, I, that's, but it's not. It's oh, like, you're being generous. People double voted. <laughs> it wasn't that much. It was, we have, a four, I think, 453 responses. You have the results here, and we, had, um, four, we have 432 children, I believe, in our, our kindergartens. So the, the, um, the majority, or I shouldn't say the majority, but the largest number of parents, actually about 200 families, would prefer to stay the course and have the last day of school on the 28th. And I received quite a few emails from parents, uh, and I'm sorry to those that I haven't been able to respond to, it's just that I did receive a few uh, more than I could, is that that even though we're trying to do this, what we think is timely for them, even this this, um, far out is still going to present problems in terms of childcare camps, um, camps that they had to get refunds on because we went into that last week, and, and so there are issues around siblings that would not be at home. So all of those things we thought would be an issue uh, are an issue, but I wanted to be able to, to have the parents part of this, uh, part of the thinking on this. The, the kindergarten teachers, um, their preference is to actually have the last day be June 21st, um, with some that did not, some wanted the, the, the 25th. But since the largest number, and it's a fairly significant number of parents would rather go to the 28th, my recommendation is that we do not change the calendar for kindergarten for this year. Okay. Mr. Hanner? When will the training pl- take place then? We're going to do it on Monday and Tuesday of that week so that the teachers would be back in the classroom uh, for Wednesday and Thursday, and then of course Friday, half day. Mr. Pierce? Can I make a suggestion that um, an invitation goes out to parents and uh, to help out in their kids' kindergarten classrooms on Monday and Tuesday? It would be a great way of building, I think, a community and give um, perhaps a little bit more fun and interesting activities for the kids that way. The suggestion. Okay. Anyone else? No? Okay. So that, that is, so I will send an email out to the parents tomorrow. Uh, I've already notified the teachers before I came into this meeting so that they wouldn't hear about it at the table. And, and actually, they, they, they were back and forth about the whole issue as well, but they just thought it, would have a, uh, it was better to do it on Friday than on Tuesday just because of the, the shorter week there. So at any rate, I think this is going to work out, and um, we certainly have more professional development for them as we move through next year. So this is going to, we're going to give them the kind of sustained support that they need to, to do this. And the other question I had was, was, that, was the reason why we're coming to this decision or now because we needed to take the vote to see how the pilot went this year, and we took the vote as a committee last? In other words, we couldn't have had this out there as an option earlier on. In Correct. The we couldn't have done. We, we wouldn't have known if this was the right program for us. That's right. I, I you can't put this out in October, and though some parents would have wanted to know it in October, we really couldn't do this until we had the the approval on the curriculum. Right. So, it is it is what it is. But I think that this is going to work, and we're going to make sure that the the classes are covered, and that they're going to have um, quality activities during those two days. Yeah. Um. More superintendent report? Sure. I, um, actually, I'm going to give, since I'm be talking a lot, I'll let uh, um, Laura Cheston talk a little bit. We actually received notification that uh, Arlington Public Schools would receive um, an award from the College Board due to our continued success with our AP, uh, ta- our, our, the AP achievement of our students and our increased enrollment of students taking AP courses. And I'll let Laura talk about this. 
Um, we were notified by the College Board that uh, they have a grant program that is funded by Google, and their program is to increase the number of underrepresented groups, uh, students of color and females in what they call STEM, so science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics AP classes. Um, there are a number of classes that they would like to see increase um, enrollment in underrepresented groups, um, calculus, um, BC, um, some forms of physics that are also calculus-based, that are based on mechanics, um, environmental <coughs> science, AP stats, and AP computer science. They offered schools that had shown um, improvements in their AP um, enrollments the opportunity to receive additional funding to offer more AP classes. So we will be offering AP statistics um, next year for the first time in a while. <coughs> and our environmental science class will be changed to an AP environmental science class. Um, the College Board will provide funding for the two teachers for those courses to attend the AP training. They will be providing money for materials based on the, uh, the kind of course. So um, it's around a little under 2,000 for the AP Stats class, all the way up to 7,500 for materials um, for the Environmental Science class. Um, we had to make a commitment to offer that course for three years. We have been successfully offering environmental science so and had been looking to improve, uh, upgrade it to an AP class. Um, but this will allow us to do it because it will provide the training for the monies for the training for the teacher and the materials. Um, in addition, uh, because we have uh, agreed to become part of this program, and, and as part of this program, we will be uh, uh, reaching out to underrepresented groups in, within our own student body to try to increase our enrollment. And all the College Board has asked for is due diligence on our part. Um, but uh, because we have agreed to be part of this program, in any of our STEM classes if the, that we've offered up to this point, uh, if the teacher shows um, an increase in enrollment for the next school year, of uh, students from underrepresented groups and those students score a three, four, or five, the teacher will receive um, a monetary uh, award for each of the students that scores three or four or five for if they have an increase in the number of under-enrolled, uh, underrepresented groups. So it's sort of a two-pronged program. So it's a, quite an exciting program and it's gonna allow us to uh, really um, offer um, some classes we've been looking forward to doing so. Um, you had to have at least 10 students. Um, we would have liked to have offered AP Computer Science, but just were not sure that we would have had the enrollment that we needed to do that. So we just made the decision to just stick with these two. And offering AP Stats will offer uh, another alternative for a fourth year of um, mathematics at the AP level for students who may not want to take calculus. Great. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, based on a previous topic, I just want to add that the Commissioner of Education in February 2011 stated the following, um, all days lost um, due to health, weather, or snow emergencies from the first day of school to March 31st needs to be made up um, to ensure 180 days. If you lose days between April 1st and June 1st, as long as you get to your 185th scheduled day, you no longer have to add days. So we will be at the 185th day. So should we lose any days after Monday, we do not need to make them up. And any district that loses days after June 1st never has to make them up. So we are in Phew. good shape. All right. Good shape. Thank you. Oh, yay. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. You got Friday, okay. Saturday, Friday, yeah. Oh, we don't have school. We're going to have school tomorrow, so we're all set. Well, that's enough. That's enough. Squeak. Thank you. <laughs> good job. And it was it. Good, job. good research. My memory was that it was later, but that's good. Very good news. Thank you for looking that up. All right. All right. Yeah, I, um, I, I think that the group may. Are they here? Yes. Uh, they're are still they? waiting for Fred. Oh, okay. okay. He was at an awards. His award, yeah. Yeah, awards team. So we can, because there's more to go on. There's more. Mm. Um. Robotics. The robotics team this year did very well. And it was a young team last year, it was mainly ninth graders. This year it was 10th. Uh, they went into the semifinals. And they were, it's very complex. Uh, Mr. Weather was telling me how this works. But essentially, at the, at the state finals, um, they were brought into the group because they thought that Arlington team had something to offer 
another team. They partner up. It's a very interesting, different kind of competition than many others. It's a, it really um, fosters a lot of collaboration. But at any rate, the good news is our team did well, and they're doing better, and uh, they, they got to that level this year, which is terrific. So was that semifinal state or semi? Yeah, state. OK. Mm -hmm. There is a, um, the, the curriculum, and uh, I don't know if, if Jeff was going to, maybe they're here right now. We can put this off. Okay. Okay. So we will now to take the uh, Arlington Police AYCC Partnership Diversion Program off the table. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And we. Hey, Hi. thanks Hi. for coming. Hello. Thank you. Dr. Bodie, would you like to? I would, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. I don't know. I think that you probably know everyone that's here, but let me introduce them if uh, you do not. Um, we have Chief Chief uh, Ryan, mm -hmm. who is the chief of the police force, who is here, and we, um, Mary Villano, principal of the high school, Ellen Digby, who has many titles. Court, uh, court liaison, attendance, REMS, homeless, she, she does many things. And uh, Colleen Ledger, who many of you know, is the director of our, um, what you, it's the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition. And the reason everyone is here tonight is to talk about the diversion program and what we're going to do moving forward. Now, I don't know how public this information is yet that Ellen Digby has decided to retire. Uh, yes, sad but true. We've tried, we tried, but she's she's going to do that. Um, and and with uh, and at the same time, one of the things that's happening is that the grant for the diversion program is ending in September. So this was a chance for us all to be thinking about what we what we needed to do going for, um, forward. Um, and if whether we would change the job description substantially for Ellen's position and expand it, we certainly need to, um, that would involve responsibilities for the diversion program. Now for a lot of people, they don't really know what the diversion program is and uh, Colleen is going to give us a, an overview of it because in, in our view, um, and I certainly I know that the people that are here this evening to present to us feel very strongly about how important this is and what an impact it is, positive impact it's made on the high school. Rob has put together, uh, in collaboration with everyone, a new job description uh, for this position, which tonight we want to ask your approval for. And once we have that approval, then we'll be posting this position right away. Uh, and the reason we want to move this forward is that with Ellen retiring at the end of June, it would give us a chance to have whoever is chosen to have some overlap time because it's a, it's, there's, there's a lot um, and that we need to be able to, to have that kind of mentoring happen. So Colleen, welcome and thank you very much for coming and I'll, I'll turn it over to you for right now. Thank you, Dr. Bodie, and thank you for having me here tonight. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Arlington Diversion Program and its initiative of the Youth Health and Safety Coalition. So I thought I would just provide a little bit of history on the coalition um, in case not everyone here is familiar with it. Um, so the Arlington Youth Health and Safety Coalition, we're a community coalition made up of representatives from public, so strong partnerships with the Arlington Public Schools, the Arlington Police, Police Department, Health and Human Services, um, and private youth serving organizations, um, churches, businesses, and then other community members, including parents and youth. So this is really a collaborative approach to prevention. <clears throat> In our mission, we're working to engage, inform, and empower the community to prevent and reduce substance abuse and other risk behaviors that adversely affect Arlington youth. Um, we have federal funding through the Drug Free Communities Program, so our primary focus is substance abuse prevention, although as much as it correlates with other mental and behavioral health among youth. Um, we, coordinate, we collaborate with other resources and organizations in town. Um, so our prevention focus, we're looking at primarily alcohol, marijuana, prescription drugs, and tobacco use. And we've identified these substances as the primary substances of abuse among Arlington youth, 
primarily through the Arlington Youth, um, through the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, which we administer every other year. Um, and these are the substances that are most widely abused in the community. And, and then through various community data and ongoing as assessments over the years, we're looking at certain risk factors in the community. And that's looking at just kind of the culture, the attitudes, policies, and practices that either kind of support underage drinking and drug use or somehow are permissive of those behaviors. Um, we're also looking at social and retail access, so making sure that our retailers in the community are practicing safe sales and that they're adhering to minimum age requirements. But primarily we're looking at social access, so we're looking at families um, and friends of young people who provide to them because that is the primary source. In the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, Arlington High School students um, indicate that their primary source of alcohol is older, or older, older friends and siblings. So we look at that, and then we also are looking at youth misperceptions about pure substance use um, regarding marijuana and alcohol use. Both middle and high school students have an exaggerated perception that this is the norm that they tend to think most of their peers are engaging in these behaviors, and the reality that is that it's not. So we want to clarify those misperceptions. Um, so some of our community objectives. So we want to reduce, reduce youth access to alcohol and illegal drugs. Um, also reduce youth access to uh, legal prescription medications um, or the diversion of prescription medications for abuse among youth. We want to support the development and enforcement of healthy community standards around substance use. So working with parents, families, the schools, and law enforcement to ensure that we have healthy expectations for our young people and that we enforce those standards. Um, we're also, we, we collaborate with organizations and resources in the community, community to facilitate youth access to support services. Um, highlight, like I said, highlight positive social norms and then strengthen community partnerships to prevent healthy youth development. This is what the coalition is really about. It's working collaboratively as a community, because it's a community issue um, around some of these behaviors. Um, so just a, a, a few examples of some of our initiatives. We've been working um, you know, in the school level on school chemical policies. We worked with Arlington High School on that. We'll be working with the middle school to just strengthen school chemical policies. Um, we work with the Arlington Police Department around enforcement issues. Um, the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Health on regulations around retailer, um, re retailer policies and um, enforcement of violations of um, underage sales. Um, parent education, just increasing awareness um, around youth substance use and trying to enhance skills. So we have these programs navigating the teen years and guiding good choices that are targeted to, to parents of preteens and teens. And to help keep them informed and prepared to address these issues in the family. Um, as I mentioned, retailer education, we support the Board of Selectmen and the Board of Health to provide um, training, so alcohol awareness seminars, tobacco awareness seminars, safe sales practices, and then we follow up with compliance checks with the Board of Health and the Arlington Police Department. And we've worked with Arlington High School around healthy social norms and developing social norms campaigns, again, to clarify misperceptions around alcohol and marijuana use. Um, we have a medication disposal box kiosk with the, we collaborated with the Arlington Police Department and that's a permanent kiosk that's located in the community safety building and that's for, to support people to rid their homes of unwanted, uh, unused prescription medications, um, especially those that we know could be abused by young people and others in the community. And then offering youth support, so collaborating, again, with resources in the community to facilitate access to mental and substance use evaluation and counseling. And then providing leadership training and skills development to high school and middle school students. And finally, again, we're, we're really interested in increasing collaboration and collaboration around enforcement. And I'm here tonight to talk about the Diversion Program, which is a partnership really that evolved from the schools, Arlington Police Department, and Health and Human Services. Um, so a little overview of Arlington Diversion. It's a community-based alternative to the criminal justice system. So really it enables young people to avoid prosecution um, by ensuring that they comply with 
individualized intervention plans or contracts. Um, it's really a holistic model to address high risk and criminal behavior among youth. Um, we look at each youth individually, look at sort of the underlying issues and needs for each youth, and we, and we hold them accountable, but we also ensure that there's some support around you know, mental, social, emotional health, academic needs. Um, we, looked at, uh, we identify underlying, as I mentioned, social, emotional, academic needs, mental health needs, um, and try to facilitate access to support services. Um, so a little bit about the history. It was piloted in October 2007. Again, this, this evolved out of collaboration among the schools, police department, health and human services. Um, and over time, it, we've become more involved with Arlington Youth Counseling Center, who provides the substance abuse evaluations and mental health and behavioral health counseling to our diversion participants. Um, and, and it was really prior to this, I think, and I, I'm sure Chief Ryan could speak more to this, um, youth was sort of being missed, so they may have been on you know, the school's radar or the police radar, but, and they may have been like persist persistent, ongoing, risky behaviors, but there wasn't much communication or collaboration on how to address it. Um, and we know that by you know, setting community standards and expectations and enforcing them, youth are less likely to get involved in these behaviors. So we came together and thought we don't want to we don't want to strap these kids with a criminal record necessarily. We don't want it all to be about punitive consequences, but we want to hold them accountable for criminal behavior and, uh, and criminal and delinquent behavior. And, and this was kind of the proposed model that, um, that we developed. And over time, it's become a model for the Middlesex um, DA's diversion program and for other communities as well who have looked to this because the collaboration in this community is, is really unique um, and it, it's been really effective for this program. And we've been funding this primarily, as Dr. Bodhi said, through grants through the coalition. Um, and one of our primary sources of funding will be ending in September. Um, you know, in the first few years, Arlington Police and school resource officer at the schools, they referred participants into the program. And again, these are for criminal offenses. Um, over time, we collaborated with the Middlesex DA's office and the district court clerk, and they also refer into this program now. And then in 2010, when the marijuana, marijuana laws changed, we also included citation management. So for young people who are caught either having publicly consumed marijuana or in possession of marijuana, we've offered the chance to be part of diversion in lieu of paying a fine. So as I mentioned, diversion has really been all about community collaborations. And what has sort of evolved out of these main um, departments who have been involved is that diversion is provided a clearly defined enforcement alternative for officers. So we've heard from many law enforcement officers that they don't want to, they don't want all the punitive consequences associated with an arrest um, or the sort of collateral, collateral ramifications associated with a record. But this is an, this is an enforcement tool. Mm -hmm. um, it's, increase, it's increased over time the Arlington Police Department's response to youthful offenses. So we've, we've seen report writing increase over the years um, and official action occurring as a result of diversion because they now have this tool and they can refer into the diversion program. And with that, it sort of prompted a cultural shift among police department um, personnel where they, where they kind of they see the need to address these um, criminal or substance using behaviors um, and they feel more comfortable with this as a tool. Chief, would you agree with that? Do you want, do you want to come up to the table? Could all of you come up to the table? Thank you, um, Madam Chairwoman, Dr. Bowie. I, I don't often get to sit before the esteemed school committee, so I wore my Class A uniform <laughs> tonight for you all. I hope, hope you all, uh, uh, I, I, thank you. And, and you know, it's interesting, um, to listen to Colleen go over the history of this, and, and I harken back to a tragic event um, that really triggered the fruition of the, um, the coalition. It, it followed the suicide of an Arlington High School student. And we all met after that tragic event and, and started to brainstorm and felt like in many ways we had let the village down as leaders in the community. And, and, and how then do we 
do we not let this happen again or do everything in our power not to let it happen again? And so the coalition was born from those discussions um, and from that um, the diversion program evolved. And, um, and in many ways, police and other leaders in the community were reinforcing risky behaviors on the, on the part of our, of our youth. You know, a youthful offender, we would uh, identify them and, you know, dis maybe dispose of the alcohol or, or the marijuana and not have any accountability that, to go along with it. And, um, and that was happening for many valid reasons. You know, our leaders didn't want to give these children a scarlet letter. They were making risky decisions, but we don't want to give them a scarlet letter for life, so we dump it out and forget it happened. And we, we really started to look at it in a more sophisticated way and said, that's, that's reinforcing risky behavior. So the diversion program was really the answer. And so uh, now youthful offenders are, are in a structured environment. There's a, a substance abuse assessment done. There's a contract executed. They're held very accountable to get them back on track, making non-risky and, and healthy decisions. And um, it really has been... Uh, uh, not through any work of my own, but really through Colleen and, and Ellen and others, um, a program that, that I'm very proud to say I'm associated with um, because uh, it's doing exactly what it was intended to do. And um, I, I have no doubt that we have prevented injury and or death to a, a child in Arlington as a result uh, of this program and, and as a result of these partnerships. Um, you know, Dr. Bodie, um, Diane, Rob, we're all on a first name basis. Ellen, I want to make my deputy police chief, but she won't, <laughs> she won't uh, accept the position. Um, but you know, th therein lies the value of partnerships and, and community approach to, to these difficult challenges. And, um, and uh, I, I, I really ask your support of, uh, ongoing support of this diversion program. I've offered financial support uh, proportionally uh, from um, police resources. I'm, I'm that um, uh, committed to our youth and preventing tragedy among our youth, and, and um, I could go on all night, so I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Um, so you spoke very... Did I answer your question? You did. <laughs> I, I wanted you to... I you probably did very, didn't even answer your question. ...very eloquently about how, it, how the police department have really has evolved with this program. Um, and likewise, Arlington Public Schools, I think it's really strengthened communication among school administrators, staff, um, and the Arlington Police Department around youth delinquency. Um, I, I, you could speak more to that, but um, and it's increased enforcement of school-based offenses. We've seen, um, you know, more students, I think, held accountable at the, from school um, than in previous years for, for criminal offenses. Um, and then the Arlington Youth Counseling Center, and w with a, a new grant that we received last year, has developed a clinical capacity to address youth substance use. So they're really exploring and developing the clinician's ability to implement um, an evidence-based model called motivational interviewing. And they've actually come into Arlington High School and they're working, or they're using this model with some students um, at the workplace. And we're also offering this to diversion participants as well, in addition to substance abuse um, evaluations and other types of treatment. So just a sort of summary of diversion cases. Since 2008, as I mentioned, 2007 we piloted it. But since 2008, we've had 171 youth accepted into the diversion program, so they met the eligibility requirements. Um, for a range of misdemeanors and felony incidents, although 90%, if not more, of those participants are involved in youth substance use. So that's really, that's, that was initially our concern. But it, I mean, substance use correlates with other high-risk behaviors and, in these, these instances, criminal behaviors. Um, so they're all of concern. Colleen, can I interrupt? Yes. You know, you may pause when you see felonies. I know um, some people pause and say, oh, you, you, you screen in felons? You know, when we started the program, we excluded felonies. Shortly thereafter, we had a, a, um, a couple of middle school students break into the uh, gym at the middle school to play basketball technically under the statutes a felony. Now do we want to be putting middle school kids in on felony charges? Absolutely not. Do we want to hold them accountable for the damage and, and for the harm done? Absolutely. So we quickly, it was, it was a quick learning curve 
where we went back to the drawing board and eliminated that exclusion of felonies. Uh, so, you know, I don't want you to think we're screening in, you know, violent felons, but certainly there are some felony offenses where this is an appropriate response from the community. Mm -hmm. So, okay. um, since that time, we've had, and the age ages range, I think, from 11 to age 20. So, really, from middle school um, to just out of high school, and we've had nine contract violations. So, those 171 youth were all. Um, we're all enrolled into a year-long contract where they had to meet certain conditions. Um, as Chief Ryan mentioned, community service, they had to uphold a certain academic performance, um, participate in counseling and evaluation, um, community and, and community service. So there are conditions outlined. So of those 171 who were contracted, there were nine violations. And then sort of looking at recidivism rates, there have been 16 Diverge, former diversion participants who have committed some sort of subsequent offense. Um, so that's a 9% recidiv recidivism rate, which is pretty low. It's better than the Department of Corrections doing. Right, <laughs> <laughs> right now, we do have 45 active cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so just sort of to wrap it up, what our goals for the diversion and for the community, we'd like to see this continued intervention and support around high-risk youth. This communication, this collaboration is really essential to the services that we provide. Um, and these are the key stakeholders, the, the public schools, the police department, um, the counseling agencies, health and human services. <coughs> we want to keep this and, and strengthen these partnerships. Um, and also I think we want to continue to be a model for other communities as other communities are looking for ways to address youth substance use. and. Um, high-risk behavior, this has been a successful model that um, certainly our, our project officer from the Drug-Free Communities Program, our federal grant, has, um, has identified as being really unique, especially due to our collaboration. So we want to provide this model um, for replication to other communities. And then for Arlington, we really want to just institutionalize this, where, where we don't have stable and consistent funding through grants. We'd really like to see this succeed in the community um, and, and hope that in, in some way we, we can support this as a community in a more consistent way. And, and just by way of comparison, there's a nearby community of similar size and sophistication that has responded to youth uh, substance abuse with zero tolerance. I am not um, a supporter of zero tolerance approaches. They have a, a zero tolerance arrest or criminally charge every youthful offender. And I think that when you, when you compare that model mm -hmm. to a more sophisticated preventative model, certainly a lot more work, a lot more time and energy and commitment and resources, but at the end of the day, um, far superior um, leadership from our community leaders in, in, in engaging in preventative measures. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, Mary and I and, and Ellen, I mean, you know, we have this partnership that, that, that we're laser focused on, on the health and safety of these kids, and, and uh, I'm proud to be a member of this team. Uh, Mary, you want to talk, and I know as well, about the program from your point of view. Um, I will just precede that by saying that there is someone who oversees the program right now has paid for the grant, and that's why we're looking at how we're going to institutionalize this. Mary? Well, I don't think I could explain it any better than Chief Ryan just did, but from the high school perspective, this has been a godsend for us because these issues come into the school in many different ways, and um, when we need help, we know we can rely on the police department, the coalition, AYCC. It really is a community approach. Um, we brainstorm together. They support us. They listen to us if we have a concern. It's, it's really... It's a collaboration that is um, very strong and very effective. And the schools can't do this kind of work with kids alone. It has to be, as I think Chief mentioned, the village. It really is a village approach, and um, it, it really needs to continue. So I strongly support that myself. And I'm going to pass it on to Ms. Digby. Are you all <laughs> <laughs> We've tried, we've tried. <laughs> I think that um, the best 
um, thing about diversion is for you to ask us some questions about it. Because it's so successful, we can sit up here and we can talk about it, but we have so many things that have come into play. Our memorandum of understanding through the DA's office, we never had this before. So we can talk to other schools, we can talk to other collaterals in town, and we're protected by the law. And it's, that's very important for a school department. And we still guard the privacy of our kids. So, and there are value-added benefits, you know, school safety being on everybody's radar these days. You know, there are value-added school safety benefits, which I'm sure we'll be talking about in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but I, I agree with Helen. You know, questions get you know, we're probably confused. Right, <laughs> Mr. Hayner. <laughs> do any of the graduates, or do you get them back involved? Is there any thought to do that? Not at this point. Okay, I They're didn't know. so happy to be rid of us once <laughs> they move, when they finish their contract. Do they recognize I the, think the they positive recognize value it. of what they've, the alternative, what it would have been? Yes, I mean, it, it saves you from appearing in court, it saves your parent from getting you a lawyer, and it saves you from getting a record. And it gets you back on the right track. Right. Okay, Mr. Swickman. So what do you need from us? <laughs> Support. Well, in what way? Well, I think that when Colleen tells you the amount of money that we're going to need, I think that Fred is going to kick in and the school department's going to kick in and we're going to make it happen. It's a labor-intensive process. Mm -hmm. These follow-ups and oversight mm -hmm. is very labor-intensive. Mm -hmm. you know, managing 40 cases is, is a good investment from our perspective. It's a great investment. We manage the community service. Mm -hmm. Last summer in all that heat, those kids are out there pulling weeds mm -hmm. and painting and I mean, they do it. Mm -hmm. I'm just seeing the value in it, yeah. and, uh, and, uh, and this is just, I think, a stellar program. And, and, and I want to know what we can do to let this flourish, because I, I can tell you just from your numbers that you've made a difference in, in the lives of, of these young people, a very positive difference, and, and I want this to go on. Right. So we incorporate this in my job description mm -hmm. as number one, mm -hmm. and then that the person that takes over whenever we post it, mm -hmm. that person will have responsibility. Ms. Mm Starks. -hmm. Um, so how many uh, students can we handle at one time now? Well, we have 45 right now, yeah. and there's always room for more. Mm -hmm. Right, so what is the current? 70 during the summer. Mm -hmm. 70 during the summer? And how many staff do we have that work in the diversion program? Well, right now, there's about three or four of us that work. But that's not counting that they have to go for substance abuse, mm -hmm. they have drug screening, mm -hmm. they have counseling. Okay, but the people who are administering, making sure, following up with them, checking in with them, doing all of those things. Our school resource officer, myself, right. and uh, another coalition member. Okay. Can I, I have lots of questions, so and, and can I keep going? <laughs> One diversion coordinator that choreographs all that. So it falls under that person's area of responsibility. And then, um, you know, as, as she needs support from the coalition or the police department, from now on, provide it. But we might just jump in here too. What we're proposing, and we can get into more details in a minute, we're proposing to co combine Ms. Digby's role which is while it's a school year role, the truth of the matter is she really does work most of the summer here and there on, because the issues with children don't go away. But we're thinking of combining the two because the kind of partnership that goes on, the, the person who is the coalition diversion director works closely with Ms. Digby, with the chief, with the principal, and so it makes sense. All of that would come together with one person. And of course, financially, it will be a larger uh, salary than currently we're having for, for um, Ms. Digby's position. But that's where the chief was talking about, oh, we're all going to sort of, uh, we're going to contribute to that. Mm -hmm. But that's why we're here tonight. We're trying to lay the groundwork for why this diversion program is something we don't want to lose. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't think, we're either going to have to fund it the way it is now, but the money would have to come from some place to pay for the person who coordinates it. But even though we're not happy with uh, 
with this decision to retire. It is, it is presents an opportunity to let's rethink this role and make it a 12 month role and wrap the two together. That's what's going on. And, but we want, because it's going to cost us the district more money, I want you to be convinced that this is important. Okay. Okay. Let me just ask so we're clear on what the plan is. So right now there is Ms. Digby who is attendance officer and court liaison and, court and liaison. our REMS director okay. for all of the. So we have that. Mm -hmm. And there is a diversion coordinator mm -hmm. who's funded by a grant, which is going to, the money's going to go away. Correct. And is there anything else that we're going to be talking about that we need to know about? The job itself is very broad and it's very difficult in, as you see the draft job description in front of you, to incorporate into a position title all the aspects of the job. And, you know, I'm, I'm actually open to a creative title that would incorporate all the aspects of the job. But it does, as, as Dr. Bodie mentioned, it includes the attendance officer, court and home liaison, um, diversion coordinator as part of this, REMS. There's so many aspects okay, to but it. But there's not enough other people out there that we have to be thinking about funding and stuff mm -mm. to at this point. Okay, so it's no. just taking... It's just taking, it's taking the one, two... It's, it would be one position, one person in one position <coughs> in a very broad, defined job that okay. incorporates many different uh, functions. Okay, now we'll go back, Ms. Starks. Okay, so we are not increasing the number of people who are helping in the diversion program. No, no we're not. Okay, that's my concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because this week, finding out that this was on here, I reached out to several people I knew whose children are on the diversion program, who have been in the diversion program. They say they love it, absolutely. Best thing that ever happened to their kids. But the, the problem is it's understaffed. <laughs> that, that there's not enough follow-up, that there aren't enough check-ins. So I was hoping that we were adding to the program, which is why we had this. So that's why all of my questions about staffing. <laughs> I'll take more. Okay. Um, I have another question. I was hoping that you could explain to people how individualized the plans are. I know for myself because I did some research, but um, I understand that there's a big difference. I go to a party, I have one beer, I happen to be caught up in a sweep, that's one level, or that could be one set of things. Mm. It's very different from a kid who broke into a car and stole a GPS unit. It's very different from a kid who's got a drug problem who also may get caught up in a sweep but had drugs on them. Can you explain how those plans are created and what well, how individualized they are well, I think I also, think that's a real strength. this also comes from the police report mm -hmm. it's generated from the police report and how that police officer has written that report because if we do have a sweep which we did have and we had 17 young people involved in it and they all were charged the same because mm -hmm. it's like the other jobs you do if it's across the board if you don't live in Arlington you get thrown out it's like the same with this program. Mm -hmm. So we charge them with minor in possession. We give them community service. Um, if they are in minor in possession of alcohol, they have to have a substance abuse. If it's minor in possession of marijuana, they have that as well in a drug screen. And they do have check-ins. And they have check-ins through Arlington High School. And we have permission from the parents to do drug screens, which we do. We have a separate area, which we do them. It's not in the clinic. Children have privacy, and it's worked out very well. Um, so it's a boilerplate contract that mm -hmm. is then modified based on the individual circumstances of that particular case. Correct. Mm -hmm. And even, and I don't want to take too much time, but in whenever a case is where there are cases where there are victims involved, we've also um, engaged the use of a restorative justice model where we bring victims in in a very structured environment where they can sit face to face with the offender and the offender can learn the harm they caused the victim. And then a contract is developed and that's an extremely rewarding experience. So both the offender and the victim feel far more restored than they do the traditional criminal right. justice system because they don't have an opportunity to weigh in on the contract. And right, and see them face to face, right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's modified based on the individual circumstances of the case. Great. But there is sort of boilerplate that we Sure, do. sure, you gotta start somewhere. Right. And if okay. I may just add, um, as Chief Ryan mentioned and Ellen mentioned, so there is a, a set contract, but then the coordinator does meet with the youthful offender and their families to kind of 
tailor it to their individual needs. And with the substance use evaluations, which are actually required of all youthful offenders, just because we do see a correlation between any high risk criminal behavior and substance use, all middle school and older do have to um, participate in a substance use and evaluation and adhere to any recommendations that come out of that evaluation. So that's another individualized component of the contract. And a failure result in a criminal complaint. Mr. Fielman. Well, for a comment and then a couple of questions. You know, great program and it's good to see you here and I, I think this should be a presentation you make to the school committee every year. I think it's just good to kind of have you come. Um, the recidivism rates, yeah, the recidivism rates for, for those who go to jail, you know, is like over 50%. They go, 50% of the people who are actually spend time in the criminal justice system for a violent offense and they come back out, they actually commit a crime. So um, a 9% rate is really good and um, and preventing kids from going into the criminal justice system is a great thing. I, so the, the, the two questions I have are, first of all, tell us about the interactions you have with the, any one of you, with the Middlesex District Attorney's Office. How does that work? How do you, how do you have a conversation with them so that they're, they're diverted from the court system and put into this program? How does that actually work? That's a, that's a great question. Um, may I? Please. Um, <laughs> one of the challenges with uh, the DA's Diversion program was that the, uh, the district court clerks and juvenile court clerks wanted post criminal complaint diversion. And uh, we felt strongly in Arlington that it should be pre criminal complaint diversion. The, 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 the criminal complaint is sort of a carrot that can become a stick if necessary. Right. Um, so we developed our own community based diversion program. However, the diversion coordinator is in contact with the DA's office diversion coordinator to make sure, a couple of things, make sure they're not, not already in diversion via another jurisdiction, yeah. um, and to keep those lines of communication open. The, the, another challenge we have, and these are not school-based offenses, but we have community-based offenses where children are, might be from you know, Lowell visiting town. So we'll then refer them to the, to the DA's office diversion program so that they have an opportunity to get diverted, but they're not supervised by our local diversion coordinator. So um, the reality is the Middlesex DA's office has modeled their program much of, off of what, much of what we have developed. And they do have a program. Right, right. down to our contract. Oh, good. <laughs> we should get a fee for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and this is constant struggle about yeah. seeking out a criminal complaint. And that, that's yeah, right. Hard to prevent. Yeah, that, that. We do direct divert. Yeah. So. There, because there, there's got to be some tension around some cases, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. There is. Yeah, I would, I would imagine. You know, uh, you know there, there's been some yeah. uh, allegations that, you know, it hasn't been um, um, given out fairly. And there was, you know, but these are growing pains. Right. And, and to the extent that Diverting children, not giving them the scarlet letter. You know, not everybody's going to be happy, yeah. particularly in, in our business. Um, but uh, and we've learned from our mistakes. We've modified the contracts. We've, we've gone back to the drawing board as needed. We're, we're open to constructive criticism. Um, mm -hmm. And, and um, I encourage each of you to reach out to us if, if, if you have any. We, we welcome you. And, the, and just to clarify, this program covers students until they're seniors in high school. Well, in the community, until 20 years of age. 20 years of age. Oh, so until so, so 20 years of age. Okay, so it covers the 20 so years. It's a real community-based yep. model. <clears throat> okay. Not just, not just school offenders, but community offenders as well. And then the, the question about, um, do you feel, I mean, uh, honestly, that you have enough resources to meet the demand, to keep up with all of the students and young people you have to serve? Well, you know, I mean, Obviously, you know, in a perfect world, there'd be more resources, but... but in an ideal world, we'd have more teachers and more police officers and more people. Yeah, yeah. Um, that said, I, I think we provide a quality diversion um, with proper oversight. Um, I'm hearing tonight maybe we need to be a little bit more um, uh, thorough on our follow-ups, and, and we're going to take that um, um, as, as good, bona fide feedback. You know, could we use more resources? Yes. It becomes a matter of priorities. And, Dr. Bodie is going to uh, ask you for resources. I've spoken with the town manager, and we're going to step up and provide some resources and, and 
institutionalizes that. Make it a, a piece of, of, of the kind of our own thing and, and not rely on our own. Yeah, and that's my final point. It's, we have two key players in this who are leaving, so it is important that this that this continues. You my hand <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, and I and I, and I think it's important. That, you know, we we have the experience of creating programs in, in Arlington and elsewhere, and then when key people leave, sometimes that program doesn't continue. So I'm glad to hear that we that we're doing everything we can to continue, which is why I, I want to put this motion on the table whenever it's appropriate. Like let's, let's keep let's people. Let's, yeah, okay, yeah. so I'm, I'm going to vote for this as soon as we get to put it on the table. Okay. Um, I, I want to first start by saying I really appreciate the value of this program. Um, as somebody that works in the school system that at the community-based justice meetings is constantly hearing about diversion program successes, um, you know, I really think that this is fabulous. It, it helps children and it educates children, which is what we're about. Um, my concerns are that we're not looking for enough resources to actually do justice to both of the key components of this new position. Um, so what I'm hearing is, is anecdotally, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm getting feedback. Um, what I'm hearing is anecdotally, this might not be enough. Um, I don't know if you've looked at the number, the overlap between our court involved um, students that um, our attendance officer and court and home liaison looks at and the diversion program students and whether there's any overlap, but with the new um, CRA law, what the attendance officer is doing and the home, school, home court liaison is doing has now increased because the burden of um, intervention is now even greater on the schools and then to have this all rolled into one position um, I can't help but wonder if we're setting up so much that it's going to be hard for this person to be successful at any aspects well, with that the, much on the, the new plate. CRA law has also opened the door for parents um, that has given them more latitude to go down and file on the kids and before it used to be just a 6 to 16 window. Now it's a 6 to 18 year old window because we don't want these kids to drop out. And it's the parents that can go down and hit that window. So that's very important. Warrants you can't do anymore in chins. We used to do chins warrants. You can't do that with this new law. Um, you can get a, um, an apprehension warrant from what I understand today from the court. But you can't even hold a child after 4.15 after the court closes on a chins. So we're not relying on that chins or the new CRA. We're relying on our resources. And I think our resources within this town are much better than any district court. Mm -hmm. and, and, and keep in mind, the school resource officer plays a critical role right. in this program as well. Mm -hmm. Well, this one, because actually you're bringing up some of the same point that Cindy brought up. And when we talked about this, um, uh, Ms. Digby was talking about her role and how this would overlap so well because you're in the school. Mm -hmm. And one of the issues is the presence in the school for check-ins. And, and do you, maybe you could talk a little bit more about the, why you feel strongly that this is probably a doable arrangement to have these two merge together. It's visibility. I'm here, the school resource officer is here. The kids come by. It, my office is kind of off the beaten track, so it's not causing a lot of, you know, scuttlebutt when, you know, Jeff is coming to my office or Bill is coming to my office, and it's, it's, it's handled a lot better. I see the kids in the corridor, I see the kids in the cafeteria. So it is visibility, and I think it's important that we keep this in the school. Are you going to call me at your office again? You <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Mr. Pierce. That's Thank you. why I'm retiring. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for, for telling us about this and explaining it. Um, I share Leva's concern. I, I think that this is a job description for two people, not just one person. Um, I'm wondering if that could be discussed a little bit more. Um, I had a question about the contract. 
are all the contracts of the same duration? Um, do they change, or what's the length of time generally? It, 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 oh, usually, one the year. length of time. A community service changes. Uh, usually, they're all a year. Mm -hmm. You know, which think about you know, the juvenile court. You're in. You pay a victim witness fee, and you're out the door. Mm -hmm. What preventative measures occur in that model? Mm -hmm. Very little or not. You know, here we've got somebody under contract for a year, under supervision for a year, substance abuse um, analysis and for a year. So it's a big commitment on, on the part of the community. It, it absolutely is. You guys are spot on. Absolutely, it's a big challenge for this community. But we also recognize the resource challenges in the community. And um, so we try to be responsive <coughs> in our request for, for those challenges, for those valuable resources. Also, just um, to address some of the concerns about the two positions, um, just to clarify, the current coordinator position for the diversion is only part-time. Mm -hmm. um, so where there are many similar or even overlapping responsibilities with Ellen's position, this will also bring it to full-time and, right. again, increase visibility at the schools, but also in more exchanges uh, during the school day. So it's going from 41 weeks to 52 weeks, which is huge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I had a couple questions too. Um, I had the same kind of timing commitments, um, wondering if this is more than one person can do, not that you folks aren't hardworking, strong people, just there's only so many things you can do at once. Um, and then one other question I had was, I just wonder how much time the diversion program saves on the police side that you know, instead of having to funnel these kids through whatever happens on the police side, um, they're kind of shunted off. And, and so it seems like there is some resource time and effort saving on that. Yes, that's an excellent point. It's, it's actually a shift of, of sort of uh, job function. So the, under the traditional model, we have a police prosecutor that works out of the police department that, that shepherds any criminal complaint through and navigates it through the criminal justice system. Um, you know, so in a case that's diverted, she doesn't have to do that. But then those responsibilities shift over to the school resource officer, mm -hmm. who then works with Ellen and the uh, diversion coordinator for oversight on the diversion contract. So it's, it's a shifting of function rather than an elimination of, of, of the function. The challenge we're seeing is, you know, um, and, and, you know, People think I'm crazy when I say this, but you know, we're seeing fewer arrests. That's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. If I can get it down to zero, you know, I would consider that a huge success. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, when, when, when you're trying to justify budgets or justify your existence, you try to inflate numbers. We're doing the opposite. Mm -hmm. We want to be in a preventative mode. Mm -hmm. And if we could have zeros across the board, I'd be very happy with that. Okay. Not, not meeting our budget. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Just yeah. so, just We're a moment. Town meeting. So I had one other idea f for funding. Can't we franchise this and <laughs> charge charge other towns franchise fees? This is a joke. <laughs> anyway, Mr. Schlickman. <laughs> I just have one other question. Given the fact that we do have a um, job description in front of us, what is our prognosis for recruiting and hiring a qualified candidate into the position? Uh, I think our prognosis will be good. We will, once this is approved, we'll post it. Mm -hmm. um, we will post internally, we'll post on, on School Spring and maybe some other resources that would attract uh, the types of candidates who would uh, be attracted to this position. Um, so I think we will um, develop an interview team of uh, the core people who would, you know, need to, uh, to interview the people interested. And I think we will have someone in place in time, probably by May, sometime mid-May, hopefully, if we can post it pretty early April, um, to get, you know, have some overlap with Ellen before she retires. Thank you. I just didn't have any experience with hiring this kind of. Yeah, position. you know, and it's a new position for me to hire, and maybe the the mm -hmm. chief and, and other people can uh, can speak more to it. But I, I do think we will have some interested candidates. Um, we're looking for people with criminal justice kind of. Uh, uh, people who have worked with with juveniles in the past, so I think there are people mm -hmm. in the community who would meet the qualifications. Mm -hmm. okay. Certainly. 
Okay, Mr. Thielman. So I move that we approve the position of attendance officer, court and home liaison, and diversion coordinator. That's one job for those of you listening at home. <laughs> okay. Uh, did you want to speak to your motion? I think we've had a good discussion about it. I favor it. I think that we should adopt the motion now and then over time evaluate the needs of the program, have them come back uh, in a, you know, next fall. And if there's uh, pressures mm -hmm. that, uh, we, that they can't keep up with, talk about additional positions. But for now, approve this and move forward. Mr. Hainer. Under the qualifications, it says uh, preferred study in criminal justice. As you go through all the different aspects of this, it sounds like this person is going to be need to be well grounded in the law. Are you folks satisfied with the qualification aspects of this? Absolutely. Fine. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. And, and it's got a real preventative mm -hmm. uh, tone to it. And that's what we're about. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further comments on this? Okay. Ms. Ms. Starks? Um, I think this is one of the most important things we can do mm -hmm. as a community, is one of the things that we can do as schools, mm -hmm. because if we can keep these kids in school, you know, they're not in the court system, they're not in mm -hmm. juvenile detention, they're here and we can help them here. I personally talked to so many people who this mm -hmm. changed the lives for their kids, you know, because they may have been dealing with an issue and you know how kids are, they never listen to their parents, and something happens and they end up in your program and just knowing that someone else now knows and someone's paying attention, the fact that they don't repeat and that they do realize that it's important that they figure out how not to do whatever it was they were caught doing. Um, I am concerned that we don't have enough um, help even if what you think you need is part-time clerical work, maybe it's the paperwork or something, some small way that we can, you know, may not be another position of this size or, or depth, but if there's any more help that we can be, please let us know because I feel like this is so important. I just, I, I really want to support this in any way we can because, you know, I, however many, the, the kids that we have helped, I feel like our kids we've saved and I just, I feel like that's so important. So thank you all for all of this. And, let us know if there's anything else we can do. Anyone else? Okay. I just want, oh, this um, I, I'm not going to repeat myself about the fact that I think this is not enough. Um, but I do have um, con some concerns that we have accurate data because I do think we're going to have to revisit this within a year or two to expand mm -hmm. the support to this program if we're truly committed to doing it well. And um, so. I'm not looking to amend the motion, but um, I would like there to be some sort of record keeping compilation beyond recidivism so we can see about if there are other ways of directing mm -hmm. financial resources to this program based on which segments of our student population we find it most serving. Mm -hmm. Or whether it just seems like there should be other ways to wrap this into our overall budget. Mm -hmm. Those are wonderful comments. Um, I see no more. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, motion passes. Well, well, oh, the, well, I'm sorry. Thank you. Well, thank the you so chief much. is still thank here. You. We don't, thank you. Uh, I, I don't know if we wanna just spend another minute just talking about some of the, the larger partnerships we also have. I mean, I, I think that what has been expressed tonight is I think you see that we all work together and um, I think that is one of the strengths of what we do here in this community. We really do see ourselves. And I just want to invite the chief if he wanted to say anything more about, um, from his point of view, uh, the strength of that partnership and ways that we do it. Right. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Bodie. You know, um, amazingly, it's not the case in, in many uh, uh, jurisdictions, you know, that surround us or in the Commonwealth. You know, um, when I say we're all in the in the boat rowing in the same direction, you know, we're all on speed dial with one another, and and um, you know, there's nothing nothing in my opinion or the opinion, that, and I'll, I will speak for them, that's more important than the health and safety of, of the uh, students in, in the Arlington Public Schools. But you know, the partnerships are, go beyond those informal speed dial type. You know, Ellen mentioned the formal MOU. 
we, we um, the coalition meets monthly on Thursday with uh, all of the stakeholders. Um, Dr. Bodie is involved with the coalition and, and intimately aware of the business that we do. Um, Mary has been wonderful, uh, you know, it's just, um, I'm saddened by the departure of the two of them, but I know with, with the leadership that we have that this, that these will rebuild relationships with whoever fill, fill uh, their shoes. So um, I think the point is, is you know, um, there's the informal networking that really is very important in, mm -hmm. in real life every day, but there's also the formal um, legal documents that, that empower and enable us to share information mm -hmm. in a timely manner, which is critical, <coughs> important when we develop information uh, about right. um, mm -hmm. safety issues. Well, I value the partnership we have and we talk Regularly. Oh, regularly, yes. My wife's been talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I also want to take this chance because because Miss Digby, Ellen Digby, who is a, just such a trusted and wonderful colleague, um, want to acknowledge the work she's done here in this district. It's, it's the been list fun. goes <laughs> long. Would, One more year. It's, no, it's <laughs> been fun. <laughs> it, yeah, but really, talk about lives being changed. Um, she has had that effect on many students. And I bet there's some adults here who have relied on your sage and no-nonsense um, wisdom. And we want to let you know how much we've appreciated it and what a wonderful colleague you've been. And we will miss you, but well-deserved moving into this next, next, next phase, phase of your life. Next, next phase, phase <laughs> next phase. Well, thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Schlickman? I also want to commend Chief Ryan since he's been here and during my previous uh, tenure on this committee, uh, it's been obvious that uh, the chief has been intent on maintaining relationships with the school department, uh, both the formal and informal, and the, and the care and commitment that he's had for the children of this town has been outstanding. And this is just another... Uh, manifestation of it. Uh, thank you for your service to our town as well. Thank you very much. I'm a proud graduate of Alcohol. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and he wasn't in diversion. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, and Mary. Thanks. Can I leave the uniform home next time? Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah come yeah, wait. Anytime. I love it. Don't it, dress up for us. Uh, <laughs> oh, he's doing formal awards this, this evening. Yeah, we have awards. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. I know. I have your I have the number. At this point, we move on to more superintendent report. <laughs> <laughs> nice or just like that. All right. Um, one of the topics that we had for tonight is um, uh, the communication that the district has with parents. And at your places is a survey that um, we have constructed, and I understand completely that we are amateurs at this, at this endeavor. I will say that in constructing this, we looked at lots of surveys to try to get to, I think was the intent of what this committee was looking for in the way of information, both in terms of both directions. You know, what ways do they get information? What ways do they prefer to get information? What, how, what they basically think of our websites? But also the other part of it is um, their feeling of their access to communicating to the district. So what I would like to be able to do is to put this survey out to all parents and give a reasonable window of, uh, you know, maybe a couple of weeks mm -hmm to get feedback, but what I would like before we do that is to make sure that there aren't other questions or additions or changes that you might want to make. And I know the Curriculum and Accountability Subcommittee saw this the other day, um, but would like your feedback. And um, it doesn't necessarily, you know, you could email suggestions as we move along. Mm -hmm. But if you think it's fine, then we might just go ahead after the after the holidays and and uh, send it out. Mr. Hainer, Does, is this going out just to the 
the school community or the whole town? This would be going out to the parents in the school district. Now, that's a whole other issue. There was a question on the Vision 2020 this year um, to the whole community, and I can get you those results. So you probably already have them. They've been presenting them publicly at this point now. Okay, Ms. Starr. Um, on the ones uh, like number one and two, um, I think six is check boxes, but seven might also be rank order. Um, where there is rank order, mm -hmm. it's, I, I find that it's best if you tell people, um, for example, on number one, you might add with one most preferable and eight least preferable mm -hmm. so that they know how to rank order them. Some people rank the higher number higher. Uh, good point. Right? Mm -hmm. So you yeah. want to tell people, right. mm -hmm. give a number one to the most important way mm -hmm. and an eight in this case because there's eight choices. In a number two, you'd say rank number one as the most important or the mm -hmm. most preferable and six as the least preferable. So, mm -hmm. you know, but just give them a little bit more. Um, just yep, that's a good mm -hmm. suggestion. That's the only thing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Ms. Hogan? Um, the, some of this actually overlaps with what the um, community relations subcommittee was looking for in terms of a survey. So I'm wondering, is there a timeline for getting this out, or would it be better to just do one larger survey that is then all-inclusive? We, we could. We could do one larger survey and bring this, this, this community relations could look at this and see what things you might want to add to it. I think as a parent, as long as it's not too long, I think when people, I know myself, when I get a survey and say it's going to take you 20 minutes, I, <laughs> you know, I, else I'll get to it. <laughs> but um, quick surveys and mm -hmm. people right. respond to a faster and mm. we'll get a better, better uh, turnout, I think. I mean, it, to be honest, it also could possibly make sense to do both, to do the surveys separate and have those overlapping questions in both surveys to, as a way of assessing the validity of the response. If, if you'd like to have a subcommittee meeting, we can hold off on this. Maybe we wait till after vacation, too, because I think as we get closer to vacation, the attention to this is going to drift. That, that would make sense because... Um, cool. We can certainly set up a subcommittee meeting for after vacation and then. Mm -hmm. Okay. Actually, before the election, <laughs> or it might be a different subcommittee. Mm -hmm. right. uh, well, then, if you have any suggestions, why don't you just give them to me? I can bring it to community relations and we can work on this. <coughs> okay. Mr. Fields. My only question is timing. You want to get this done by no yeah. later than. May, right? I mean, correct. Yeah, so I don't want to go into June. Yeah, I think you want to just be conscious of the fact that if, if we're going to delay this, new sub, new committee sits on the 11th. Pe uh, people are appointed their subcommittees, and you're talking about uh, you have to have the meeting in the third or the fourth week of April at the latest, so you can get input for the survey. So just be conscious of the time. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Good point. Um, it's exactly. The only, mm -hmm. yeah, the only suggestion I make on question five, I'd flip the. Uh, the axes, it has the, I don't know, this just doesn't, I'm not used to, to things mm -hmm. Actually, being. <clears throat> that's why, that's the standard is the way you're talking with the. Do, flipping it the other right. way, yeah. yeah. What with grade on top? You put the, the information right. available yeah, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, flip, yeah. I'll flip the axes. Yeah. I knew what you meant. Okay. Um, Okay, so if we have anything, we should either send it to you or talk to community relations and we'll figure out who's on what later and, okay. All right. Um, I just wanted you to be aware of this a little strip of land. We've had this conversation before about that little piece of land that's near the Brigham's Project. It's not called Brigham's Project anymore, but I just want you to know that they have uh, official name for it now, which is called the Mill Pond Park, a little piece, a little and there'll be bench. a sign saying the Mill Pond Park, but I just want to be aware if you saw it, that <laughs> that's what's happening. Excuse me, is that the land that they keep asking us for, or is that something no. else? Yes, yes, but it's going to have a name. They've it's decided have a name. to name it for us? Well, <laughs> there was a need to move, <laughs> there was a need to move forward with it, and 
I don't know if we would come up honestly with a better name. No. But I mean, it's still under our control. Yes, it is definitely under Fine. the school committee's control. Fine. That's all I just wanted to be able to talk about it and didn't have a name to talk about it. But it's not the piece of land that, that yes. Bill's talking about is the parking is one to be used for it's parking. It's not the parking it's lot. It's, it's, yeah, it's, no. it's, a, I, it's there's not, two pieces. Okay. There's a two chunk pieces, of the parking they're, lot they're and there's the yes. little with the, with the bench. Yeah. The bench is now a park. We right. haven't named the parking lot yet. It might be the <laughs> it might be the smallest park in Arlington. Yeah, it could be. Well, that would be interesting. I think it's it's the most valuable micro, piece of it's, property it's in the new, town. It's new. It's a micro park. Oh. There's a question for the next trivia. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Which brings me in. Park. Thank you, Ms. <laughs> Dr. Chesson. Okay. Uh, trivia B. The, I, I have to say it was so much fun, and I want to congratulate um, the foundation. The Winchester Education Foundation for just a, a wonderful day mm -hmm. and um, Arlington. Arlington. Is it Winchester? Oh. Winchester. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, I, you know what? Because I've participated in that for so many years, it's just like in the back of recess of my mind. I'm sorry. The Arlington, the Arlington trivia B. It was wonderful. It was so much fun, and the team from the school committee did very well. We really didn't, Kathy, but... You didn't make it You didn't make it in the... You didn't make it in the finals, but you did well. Oh, you, you are very kind. <laughs> you could have given us some well partial credit there. You did well on the construction, there. right? We, that bad, yeah, we did, did the best we could. We, with what we had to work with. <laughs> <laughs> we were, yeah. yeah. We had a lot of fun, and mm -hmm. it was a good time. It was a great, yes, it was great, a great time. Great, great event. For the community. Yeah. Yeah. Terrific. Yes. And we had more teams than ever participated this year. 28. 28, 28 teams. 28. That's a lot of teams. No, they had a, oh, a, a third of the last moment when, yeah, they had 28. And, and there was a, another feature this year where when they did the construction, a team from the audience could come up and do it as well. And I think that the, the was mainly the, the students in the audience, they really loved it. In fact, their hands were waving to be able to be picked yeah. for it. So it was a, it was a fabulous day. And it's just another way that the foundation supports mm -hmm. the schools mm -hmm. and um, proceeds from that also will ultimately support mm -hmm. the schools. So I think next year with the how widely it was viewed that, um, who knows, we might have a, yet a fifth round. We'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so then lastly, just one, I got to say, so thank you on behalf of mm -hmm. the foundation and the schools because without a judge, mm -hmm. she Dr. Well, Bodie you. was one of our I was a judges. Judge, I find that that was fun. That was so much fun. Okay. Well, thank I you. enjoyed it a lot. And the last thing I wanted to tell you is that the we have completed kindergarten registration. Wow. Uh, yes. And the winner is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's still more work to be done. I, there's still we're still calling some people who we sent packets to who have not registered, but that number is fairly small and it's going down every day because we have one of, uh, one of our staff people making the phone calls. We also had a lot of people who put their registration into the computer but didn't come to register. Those people have been notified as well. So um, I think that probably by next week we will have had what our expectation would be for the number of students that we think will be in kindergarten will be registered, mm -hmm. which is Terrific. And what was interesting, as you know, when we set up the buffer zones, mm -hmm. that represents about 25% of the land mm -hmm. area. And interestingly, it's about the same number in terms of the percentage of students coming into kindergarten that are in buffer zones. Mm -hmm. So roughly, you know, it will, I'll have be able to tell you more exactly once we get the, you know, the last 30 registered. Mm -hmm. Do you know if we got anybody from Mill Street, the Brigham's area? I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> no. That would be a good question. Uh, we'll look at that. So we'll be able to do the, um, we can't, see the problem without having complete registration really couldn't do the work we needed to do with buffer zones, but I'm, I think we're going to be able to move forward with that over the next two weeks. It's good. Did you get any feedback on the process, good or bad? Um, the, the feedback from our staff was that it went very well. We, it was very organized. Um, we did not survey the parents. Maybe that means something that we could do down the road, because now we have 
all of their emails. Right. That's one thing about having them in power school. So that might be a possibility. Um, and I also want to just acknowledge the great work of the team that put this together, with Leilani D'Agostino, who really set up the whole structure for this, and Adam Karofsky, who is worked on creating the software, and he was available many of the nights for people who had difficulty. And, our, and then our, our, our um, secretarial staff and our nursing staff who were there and volunteered, uh, actually, to be there, and were very, well, they were paid, yes, but, but still, <laughs> they didn't have to do this, and they were willing to do it, and that makes a big difference. Um, so we, we still have to tabulate what the total cost was of doing this, and we'll, we'll get that number to you, but it was really, I thought, well done. But the biggest concern was to make sure that we could get everybody in, and we had some weather days as well in this process. So all in all, it went well, and I think that's it um, that I have. I don't know if there's anything. What? Oh, yes, yes. Thank you for reminding me. I probably should have done this on the, on the Thompson update. Um, the, what we have decided to do um, and, and we've, is to open the after-school program at Thompson in the model of the Hardy School. And in fact, the director of the Hardy School program is going to set up the after-school program and oversee the after-school program of Thompson. Uh, prior to the, uh, the project, Boys and Girls Club had a program there, as well as a program at Boys and Girls Club. <coughs> their their after-school <coughs> program remains very strong and will continue to remain very strong because <coughs> there's simply not enough program space for all the students that want to be in after-school. Uh, but they agreed that it that um, this is a, a fine uh, way to proceed, and in fact, I think over time, as we we have other programs that may um, not continue, we, we're obviously going to have an after-school program at all schools. But the idea is that these will be under the auspices as 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 other programs perhaps retire that we will continue this. So I'm very pleased with this. As you well know, the, the Hardy After School program, as, as many of our programs do, have a, has a wonderful, op, a wonderful reputation. Um, we will probably be able to, to have 100 students in the program, which would be terrific. So we've, we've, um, we've begun all of that work. And in fact, um, I think even this, this week, they had their first meeting with the Thompson families to begin the the registration process for that program. So if families want to, are interested in participating next year, they need to contact? Um, that's all, well, I, I, that's all been sent out to parents. That's okay. all been handled at the school level. Okay. And Thompson kindergartners that have registered, we will get that information to them as well. Okay. Right? Now there was one more thing because it was under the superintendent's Let's talk about the pilot or the the superintendent's evaluation. We're going to need a lot more discussion. We're all involved in this. I know that uh, Cindy and Leva, you you're involved with it, and of course uh, Paul is as well in your own districts. But this is a this is a a major initiative at the state level of having a educator evaluation system that involves and all, all levels of um, personnel in school districts, teachers, administrators, central office, superintendent. The superintendent evaluation process it, it was something that we're going to need to work on together as a committee. Tonight is not the time to really get into that as much but rather to talk about what a pilot would look like, just sort of to try it on a little bit to see what, what, how it would work, which is exactly what we're doing throughout the rest of the district. We've talked about that before. And uh, that sure. That? <clears throat> you have a handout here, which is a purple sheet, the Arlington Effective Educator Development System. 
you have one in the desk? This new initiative by the state involves all levels, superintendent, assistant superintendent, all administrators and all teachers. Um, we want to, this spring, have a pilot at all those levels. And we've already begun the pilot. Um, Mr. Hayner has been involved with the task force and is very well the, where, we're, where we're going with this. So in the pilot that we're doing with um, the teachers and administrators, we selected a limit, we only selected two standards. In fact, for administrators, it was only one standard because of just the, how, uh, you'll, you'll see a, a diagram in a second as to why we only picked one standard. But we were looking at um, ideas that would go as a through line from the superintendent to administrators to teachers. And here tonight are the, the two co-chairs of our task force, Linda Hansen and Laura Chesson. So they've been very much involved in all of this. But in this pilot, we are only asking participants to have one goal. And we're focusing only on two indicators. And what you see in this, in this next slide is how all of this is linked. The, for principals and superintendent, the two indicators that we're looking at is the instruction indicator and the, and the assessment indicator, which, as you look in this diagram, corresponds to two different indicators and two different standards for teachers. So for superintendent, the assessment indicator corresponds to the assessment indicator for principals. That's the through line. And then t for teachers, it goes to standard one indicator B. When we're looking at the instruction indicator, which is standard one indicator B for the superintendent, the black line there, that, that corresponds to the instruction indicator for administrators but it corresponds to standard two indicator A for teachers. And, and these represent the through line, and that's what we were trying to achieve with this particular um, pilot. So teachers who are in the pilot um, are picking a goal that corresponds to one of these two indicators. And in general, it corresponds to one of the, their goal for their professional learning community. So we're trying to keep everything as, as related and cohesive as possible. So that's how the rubrics are connected. Now, if you look at the next slide here, you, what we've indicated here is what does proficient look like just for the um, assessment indicators? And you can, I won't read all of these, but you can see what proficient looks like for superintendent. And this one I will read, but the other ones, uh, not that I won't. Uh, proficient would be supports administrator teams to use a variety of formal and informal methods and assessments, including common interim assessments that are aligned across grade levels and subject areas. So the superintendent is working with the principals um, and making sure that this is going on at the, at the school or department level. And then the principal is working with individual teachers to support um, that work happening at the classroom level. So that's the idea is to have all of these um, be connected to each other. Now, one of the district goals, now, so the goals that the superintendent will have are going to be very much linked to whatever the district goals are. And then that continues in its through line through all, the entire process. So one of the goals that we had this year um, for goal two, student achievement, was to, number four, was to create and identify two common Wait, assessments. Two common assessments at every level in all disciplines to measure student progress in order to maintain high expectations for learning, teacher consistency, and a common focus on instruction. 
And in fact, this particular goal is a sort of a foreshadowing of work that we need to do next year for the whole evaluation system because part of the educator evaluation system is to, is to be able to look at the impact on student learning. And, and at the, um, we'll talk more about these district measures that are being asked of us at, a late, at another committee meeting, but not tonight. So at any rate, that was our goal for the district. And so therefore my goal that I would use in the pilot would be that, that, that those assessments were in fact created. And then that has a correspondence to the work that principals and curriculum leaders have been doing to ensure that that is happening and certainly the work of teachers um, to, to accomplish that. I think one of the things that, this is an aside to this whole, uh, is that one of the things Arlington I think is doing very well is, is looking at these uh, measures of student progress at the, at the classroom level and we want the teachers that are teaching in all the different disciplines to be very much involved in what they think are the best measures of student progress. And so this, these kind of discussions are going on at all, um, in all disciplines, including guidance and related services. Now, this year we have piloted some already. Next, next year we'll pilot some more. But the idea is, have we identified them? And that's, that's the specific goal for this year. So um, I would like to have us engage in the pilot uh, so we get a chance to feel how it works and that's really that's really what the intent is um, certainly at the other levels of this process and how we move forward with this is uh, is something that we want to maybe talk about whether it's going to be at a committee subcommittee level the kind of discussions we need to have in the pilot and um, the thing that's sort of um, different about the superintendents, the uh, school committee superintendent part of this is that, well, let me first say what, how it works at the other levels because then you can see what the issue is. What we're looking in Arlington as this is a coaching model for continuous improvement. So a lot of the emphasis is on the conversations that occur uh, after an observation, um, and that is not something that's how it's built into our structure of how to do it. So how do we fit this education evaluation system into the structure that exists in a school committee superintendent? And I think that um, uh, Bill went to a meeting last week, and I, I think that there's a lot of questions as to how this works technically, but it, I don't think we need to talk about it tonight, but rather this is something we need to talk about in some kind of a committee form. Okay. Mr. Schluck. Uh, at the uh, curriculum instruction assessment and accountability meeting, we had a fairly extensive uh, discussion of how we'd want to proceed, uh, both in terms of the pilot and in terms of the actual evaluation that we would be be doing under the new regulations next year. Uh, the thinking in, in our conversation was that uh, because the pilot really is more of a professional development uh, session for all of us, the school committee and the superintendent to learn how to do this and to learn the pieces, that it would be appropriate for us to uh, do a professional development retreat similar to what we did for the governance project. Uh, and work through the, uh, uh, the, the pilot evaluation in, in that venue uh, so that we'd all learn how to do it so when it comes time to actually doing the formal process next year that we would have the pilot uh, under our belts as a professional development and training exercise. So that's the direction that, that the, uh, mm -hmm. the subcommittee recommended through a motion uh, at the uh, meeting on uh, Monday. Okay. Maybe we should make a motion now. Maybe you should make a motion now. Yeah. Um, so I'll make a motion um, 
that uh, I just want to make sure I've got the. Uh, I, I move that we schedule a professional development retreat for the purpose of working with the superintendent to pilot the new evaluation tool. Second. Does anyone have Mr. Hainer? No. Oh. You weren't at the mini. Do you, did you, is you comfortable with this? Yes, I, I, I am. Yeah, okay, I think it's a great idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just logistically, you know, we're going to be in this crazy time when we've got a chair leaving, chair coming in, and all that stuff. So I think we should, if this is something, if we can get a doodle going, I realize that we, there's, a, there's an election, but if we can get a doodle going to get some dates on the mm -hmm. calendar, it would be good to do. I'm trying to be as diplomatic as I can. We've got to get a doodle going, mm. even though there's an election. Chair has to doodle. <laughs> doodle, a doodle, a doodle, okay. and. We'll do it. We'll do okay, it. Okay, how. how doodle. How long do you anticipate this requiring? And I, we're, we're not quite sure, but we figure that uh, if we do a little bit of homework first, we'd be able to do it in one session. But how long is the right, session? Right, but how long is the uh, session? Is I need to know how long to set the doodle up for. Oh. I, I would recommend six hours. Six hours? I don't think we need six no, hours. No, I don't think no. we need six okay, hours. Okay, I'd recommend four hours. No. Okay. <laughs> um, having spent, my gosh, how many hours have I spent? At least 20 hours on the new evaluation tool and writing up the indicators. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, my brain's going, it's like SEJ something, SEIJ now and all the stuff about how, the, what formula you used to approach in the conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this could be a very time-consuming process, and I think we need to look at it in two parts. Um, one, as negotiating some of the, not negotiating, but just um, working through some of the initial mm -hmm. challenges around how we want to approach it, whether we would like to do some formal professional development around this, um, how we see structuring it, whether everybody's involved with each part, because it, in essence, I see that as somewhat guiding what type of um, retreats we need to have together around the tool. So I think this might need to be a two-phase part, the first phase being shorter and then the second phase being somewhat dependent upon perhaps getting some sort of um, technical yeah. assistance or, yeah. or PD, more formal PD in for right. us around this. I saw Mr. Hanner. I agree with that concept. I just want us all to be aware when DESE put this together, gave a lot of thought to the teacher aspect, chunked it up to the administrator, gave no thought to the superintendent because you, know, you now have one person being evaluated by seven. And I can't imagine at a regional district with 16 to 17 people having to somewhat act independent and could coordinate and put it all together. Okay. So I would agree with, with Ms. Hyams aspect of it. That's so Initial partly just having three. had to set up doodles and stuff and also thinking this is a pilot as opposed to the real thing that there we can also do the educate some uh, I'm not sure do all of us have to learn everything all at the same time I would agree. and then um, build um, on that. Actually there's so, supposed to be inter-rate reliability. I'm, I'm not tool. questioning that I'm saying we have to set up a pilot very quickly mm -hmm. and do we all have to be part of setting up that pilot very quickly i'm not saying once we get to the real thing yes all of us need to be at this at the same speed but there's a difference between setting up the pilot and doing the real thing mr schlickman yeah i, I my original thought was to do two smaller uh professional development retreats one in which we get together to set the ground rules and figure out what we're doing and second to pilot the actual um, uh, evaluation uh, with with each other uh, and that might be the way to go if we set but the thing is if we set up one uh, retreat professional development session and we can see where we end up at the end of that and make a decision as where we want to go after we hit the first one because we are granted on uncharted waters, despite the fact that many of us have been trained to some extent within the new system and the rubrics are pretty specific, uh, 
it's more uh, an element of us getting a feel for how we are going to do this as a public body and how we're going to enter, engage in a relationship with the superintendent that's going to uh, honor her work and be a respectful, thoughtful process. Right, and, and part of my pushback is just coming from my experience in having to try and schedule you guys to go somewhere. And, yeah. and um, so part of it, I want to be sure we all are needed. And second, I'm saying sometimes that doesn't happen. So right, right now what I'm hearing is three hours as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Do we need, is there anyone else who needs to be brought in? Dr. Bodie, Dr. Chesson, and- Dr. Bodie needs to be there. We, okay, <laughs> no, no, I know, I know. I'm just, how much, how, who else is- We, we, did, we did talk to, uh, uh, that it might not be a bad idea to see if we can get Nancy back for, for this. But I think that we are uh, capable of doing this on our own. Okay. Who's Nancy? Walser. 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 Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Thiem. Yeah. My opinion. I think we would be helped by a facilitator with this. Yeah. I, I think. I think. It, otherwise, I'm not sure who would chair it, how we would move it along. Right. And that's part of my concern. Trying to think about how to do this logistically. I think it's a three. My personal opinion is it's a three-hour chunk of time with Nancy Walzer as our facilitator, facilitator because she knows us and she's familiar with this, mm -hmm. and it's on a weekend. Okay. Can I just propose an alternative, having not been at your discussion and just seeing this for the first time tonight? Mm -hmm. To me, it would make more sense if three of us, maybe one of the subcommittees, decides we're going to be the brain for this, and you guys figure it out, and then and and you could have the facilitator and, and talk and work out which thing it is, what. You know, you pick. You're going to pick the goal. You're going to to forward to the rest of us. You're going to pick the indi indicators and all that, and you have that worked out. And then we have another meeting with all that stuff already worked out, with a facilitator to kind of guide us through with the whole committee. I think that's a, that's not a bad idea. What, I mean, the, the only place it could go right now is the CIA a committee. So it would be a question of setting a meeting next week, which I'm happy to do, mm -hmm. if we can get Kathy's schedule and all three of our schedules lined up. We can, I mean, we can, why don't we do this? We can try to get a meeting of our subcommittee with, with Dr. Bodie next week to try to get this a little better fleshed out if you want. Okay, Ms. Hyam. I, um, I actually disagree with the concept of having a group of three do it because there tends to be an expectation that the work has already been done and then mm -hmm. we're just moving forward with it. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the most important things we mm -hmm. do in our, in our roles is our evaluation of the superintendent and to pretty much, you know, have this mm -hmm. powerful tool, have three people bring forward a recommendation but not necessarily have input from the rest of the mm -hmm. committee around some of their concerns. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, get to the point where we're tweaking. It, it just doesn't seem like the way to to build a system. And and just to respond, so the reason that I'm suggesting this as an alternative is that I'm not disagreeing that it's important. I'm not disagreeing that we all need feedback. But I'm saying what we have to do is bring a pilot to going from zero to seventy as quickly as possible. And we don't move that fast as a group. I mean, as, as a group of seven. We move faster as groups of three, and then we pull the rest of us along. And that's why, I, and, and I'm not disagreeing with any of that, and clearly that stuff going, this, I'm focusing on this as the pilot, and I'm trying to pr create a shape that then we can work forward from, and we're going to be saying, well, you know, I wouldn't have picked that indicator. So you know, you'll remember that when you go, when we have the real thing. But that's fine. Um, there were other, Mr. Okay, Mr. Well, I'd Schlickman. like an opportunity okay. to respond, though. Okay. There are ways for us to all be at a retreat and work in smaller groups with timelines to, to produce certain mm -hmm. events, certain things by a certain okay. time. Mr. Schluckman? Yeah, the purpose of the pilot is not to produce an outcome. The purpose of the pilot is to be the professional development uh, for the entire group. So for us to go and put it off to a subset of the committee, I think, would not achieve the purpose of the pilot. I mean, the thing is, is we talked about 
the, the, the CIAA subcommittee could coordinate and make things work, but in terms of uh, the process and the learning involved, we all need to be there. Well, why, why, don't, we, why don't we do this? this? This is about possible suggestions. Yeah. So one idea might be that <clears throat> we do a, a poll to find a three-hour block of time. We try to find mm -hmm. uh, a facilitator. And if we could find a time for our subcommittee to meet, we can kind of do some thinking uh, next week for an hour about the framework or the, the, uh, what, what the, the, you know, the, the structure of the retreat. Mm -hmm. So maybe, maybe what the three of us can do in a subcommittee, rather than design the whole tool, is just mm -hmm. give some more specific, detailed thought to the, how the retreat would work. So we have two things going on simultaneously, an attempt by our subcommittee to meet next week for an hour to think through the, the details of the retreat with Kathy there, and then a poll to find a time for a three-hour retreat sometime in April. Okay. I mean, I, I think that that's, that's seems to be where we're the, 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 the happy compromise here to get something moving. Agree. Okay. I agree that it's fine that a sub, like, like we said, it's a pilot, and we're all going to learn from it regardless of how much each of us individually puts into it. Um, and any of us can go to any subcommittee meeting, and any of us can send input and feedback to that subcommittee meeting. So having that subcommittee meeting, I think, is not saying that all of us can't attend it or that we can't all have input. It's just saying that someone should drive it, which I agree. I think trying to decide all seven of us is going to it is going to take six hours for us to get anything done on this because it does take a long time. And I don't mind if someone else, even if I don't agree with what the goal is, that's not the point. The point is to pick something and try it. If it fails miserably, we've learned a lot. If it is amazing, we've learned a lot. And if it's somewhere in the middle, we've also learned a lot. It doesn't, the point is to take something and go with it and try it, right? And see how it goes, whether or not it is the right thing is not the question this time, right? The question yeah, is, yeah, can we get through the process with the thing we've picked? That would be my thing. Too. Hasn't it already been picked? Hmm? Pardon me? Is it, isn't this what we're going to evaluate you on in the pilot? This one little thing, the assessments? No? Not a little Mr. thing. Hainer. But, yeah. Well, it's a, it's a small little yeah. thing. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Okay. What, what, what you've got to understand, what the intent of this is is not the specific. It is the process. It is so different. But we picked it. Oh, I know. It's, that, it's yeah, more than just it. picking a goal and making a judgment on it. Trust me. Okay. Mm. There's, there's so many aspects of this thing. That's the easy part. All right. Okay. Yeah. Am, I wrong? Okay. Am I wrong, so Dr. Bodie? We have a motion. Nope. Did you want to say something? I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say, I, I think that the idea of retreat is a good one because even though it's the pilot and we're going to learn something from it, we have to really think about what it's going to look like next year because, again, think about the through line. So what we do, it's going to, be, it's going to affect everything else as we go forward. And interlaced with this is, of course, the work we're going to do in the next month on district goals. Yeah. And because we've got to get those in place by mid-May. That's, that, I know, so there's a lot going on right now. So one thing that this is all supposed to start with is a self-evaluation. So are we going to assume that you are going to show up with the self-evaluation? Because <coughs> given that it was supposed to start with whoever's being evaluated doing a self-evaluation, you're supposed to start with that, and through that self-evaluation, you pick the thing that you're supposed to focus on. So I assume you've already kind of done that, given that you've picked the thing you want us to focus on. So I would also like to make sure that that piece of those pre-steps also comes with us to the, to the retreat so we can see how the process went for you in the kind of the before part, the part that happened before this. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. It, it, what's t tough about the pilot in this respect is that this goal that we had back putting back there is a goal we had for the year. And so why did we have that goal? That's where the self-evaluation comes in. Right. When we say self-evaluation for the superintendent, we're really talking about the evaluation of why we're moving in certain directions with certain goals. What, what were the 
the the um, the drivers for putting right. that there. So it's not so much a self evaluation that, but that's because it's more an evaluation of where we are as a district in that particular area. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a motion on the table right now, which is to uh, set up a meeting. So any further discussion on the motion? Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? And I'm abstaining because I'm still questioning the possibility of actually scheduling all of you. In <laughs> no, I'm, I'm sorry, I am. Good luck, I, yeah. It, it's it's not mean, gonna happen in April. It, that's, My weekends are already <laughs> <we're>, we're, um, <laughs> so, But we'll um, work on that's it. That's fine, okay. And uh, curriculum can do as they see fit. Okay, so I will set up a meeting. Um, that's it for me. Okay. So at this point, we are on to policy and procedures. Something to report. Uh, nothing to report. Hey, budget. We heard budget. Didn't you want to say something else, Judd? Oh, yeah. I know you did. <coughs> it was uh, so into business that it, it, uh, I forgot something. Um, Kiersey, I just wanted to thank you um, for being an outstanding chair. You helped us accomplish a lot of what we we're seeking to do for the district. Um, you gave us a lot of advice. You kept us in line. Mm -hmm. And um, you <laughs> barely used that on us, which was nice. <laughs> um, you were clever in your openings, and you were always quoting important things for us to think about and reflect on. We just have a small token of our appreciation. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> just, uh, oh, isn't that sweet? A couple oh, little thank cute you. Cars. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. <laughs> oh. <laughs> what was that? Yeah. Thank you. You're very kind. And I'm not going to say anything policy. more. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Schlickman. Uh, just on a similar note, uh, when I was chair of this committee, uh, having the gavel was, was fun. Not that I ever used it, but, you know, it's just fun to have and to hold. And, and, <laughs> and, and after, I w I, after I was chair, I, I missed having it as a physical presence as something to hold on to during the meeting. Uh, so uh, in that light, I figured that I'd come up with a little gift for you so that instead of having the gavel, you have something to remember your gavel by. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, your own rubber mill. <laughs> That's great. Thank you very much. My gosh. Look out whatever committee you put her on. <laughs> this, one, this one's better sound quality. Nice. 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 Well, thank you very much. Yeah. That's very kind. Nice gun, Paul. It says mint yeah. craft on it, too. Yeah, there you go. From Wanamaker Hardware. That's yeah. like, awesome. Local. <laughs> you all are very kind. Not Hollaback and Cop. <laughs> That's the sporting okay. gift. That's the one the question we missed leaving. So, Shop in Ireland. Um, <laughs> budget. Um, let's see, budget, uh, we haven't had a meeting. We did go to the um, uh, finance committee meeting. I thought that went well. I was uh, happy to see that our budget did pass uh, 14 to one. That was good. Um, so onward and upward to um, town meeting. Um, I also want to put in my two cents. Uh, it has been a great year. It has been wonderful serving under you as chair. Uh, you've managed to pull our meetings together and really um, keep us on on task which I know is hard given that we all love to talk um, but uh, I just I feel like uh, your leadership this year has been great and uh, I really want to thank you for everything and uh, best of luck hope to see you back here in a couple <laughs> weeks. <Thank you. laughs> okay community relations um, nothing to report but <laughs> as I will certainly take the advantage to thank you for your chairship thank this you. year. Um, I didn't expect this. <laughs> uh, curriculum. Uh, we, I think we covered everything we needed to cover, right? <laughs> I mean, I think we've done enough curriculum tonight. So, but I want to uh, echo all my colleagues. I've worked now with ten chairs, and you were a terrific chair. The, the meetings were very well organized, very well planned, and timely. very timely. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And I always felt like I was, I was informed about everything that was going on. You called often to check in and, and go over presentations to make sure that I understood what I was supposed to do, and I appreciate <laughs> that. So thanks so much. Great, great, great job this year. And it is not easy being chair of the school committee. It's almost a full-time job some weeks. So. 
So we appreciate it. I'm happy to be passing it on. <laughs> <laughs> Facility. Again, nothing to report, but I would like to uh, indicate that you've joined a unique group of people in my life. My mother, a group of nuns, and my wife that have learned how to quiet me and shut me down right away. <laughs> Without the rubber mallet. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next two. Also add mine. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to work with you. And um, she is very organized. We go through with minute detail um, all of the parts of the, uh, of the agenda. And I think that because of that attention to detail, we are very timely. Uh, very much so. So thank you for that. And there are a lot of great things that I learned from you this year. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I didn't expect this. <laughs> Um, you got your house earlier. Um, so actually, speaking of cleaning houses, so <laughs> the next two things. So legal services, uh, I did underestimate my the duties as chair, and I overestimated my free time, and the two collided kind of unhappily, and legal services was the victim of this collusion. <laughs> um, but. We have made progress. Um, I'm hoping that the uh, presumed future chair would be willing to allow that committee to continue maybe for another month to six weeks after the start of the next year, just to pull our ends together. I'll have more time to put to it. And, and um, we, we've got loose ends that just need to be tied. And um, if that, well, we'll find out. Um, and then as chair, um, I had a couple of things just to report. First, you all received somewhere the MASC's legislative day on the Hill. The schedule has changed. I didn't write down which day it's been moved to, but it's just so you don't have it already tagged somewhere, it's not in April. I think it was in May. It's in May now. Yeah. Um, second, uh, we have, I just, you remember their letter that we report up that we wrote about gun control. Um, other school committees are now starting to realize that that would be a good idea to do. And Such we've been, uh, we have been requested to share our letter now with Cambridge, mm -hmm. uh, Monomoy, is that how we pronounce it? Monomoy, yeah. Monomoy, um, and Wilmington mm -hmm. so and far. Acton, and Foxborough. Oh, and Act no, Acton, Acton didn't want our letter. They, 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 they did their own letter, yes. Oh, okay. They had their own. Um, but, but those places have asked for a copy of our letter, and there may well be other ones coming. People are just starting to go, oh, yeah, we should do something. What about a great that. idea. <laughs> yeah. um, so, and it gave me great pleasure saying, oh, yeah, back in December we voted to do this. <laughs> um, and then the last thing is that we need to add a meeting. Besides the meeting that you want me to doodle, the next meeting is we need to add is a special, uh, which is the organization meeting. So I need someone to make a motion to have a organization meeting on April 11th at 6 p.m. Uh, so moved. For Second. the purposes of organizing ourselves. Oh, herding cats, yes. Herding yes. the cats. Right. Okay, do we have a second? Yes, second. second. Okay. and. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, so we'll have our organizational meeting. Um, and thank you. I already, Jeff missed it, but I appreciate you guys. I listened to you. I learned things <laughs> from you. She's learned a lot. I learned a lot. House. See, I, I brought. I see that, and I see, I remember the, how we began, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't let Judd knock it Is Judd going to? Uh, yeah, that's why I didn't get to knock it down. It. Now he has to take care of it. I will. Mm -hmm. Thank she you. Didn't tell you. Super she glued the pieces I first. Super glue. <laughs> Contact with them. Okay. So, moving on. Consent oh. agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and may be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant number 13113 dated march 14th 2013 total warrant amount five hundred sixty three thousand four hundred and sixteen dollars and sixty one cents minutes for approval november 15th 2012 february 28th 2013. second oh. okay 
I heard what happened? February 28th are being pulled. Any other minutes being pulled? Um, I'd like to pull November 15th just for some minor um, typograph. Okay. Cool. So, corrections. So, so at minutes. this point, the only thing that's in the consent agenda is the warrant. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so the warrant passes. So we will take up uh, the February 28th minutes first. Uh, may I have a motion to approve the February 28th? So moved. Okay. Oh, wait, that was absent. I'm sorry, I can't. Okay. Any, Is that why we're can I have, them? yeah. Oh, uh, Jed and Can I have out. a motion to approve the so moved. motion? Okay. A second. Second. Okay. Any comments? No. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, two. two abstentions. Okay, now, the, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of November 15th, 2012? So moved. So moved. Okay. Second. Second. Um, any discussion? Um, I'd like to make um, some corrections. Okay. Um, and once I read these, I will hand my copy to um, Ms. Fitzgerald. Um, on page two of six, item number two, um, the second line of commendations, the word should be vibrant instead of vibrate. <laughs> um, the last paragraph on the same page, the second to last sentence in between after access to the words insert the words materials in their language um, on page three of six um, item number five under recommendations um, <coughs> instead of new evaluation two it should be new evaluation tool, cross out the word and, and insert a period. Um, under goal one, common date, excuse me, recommendations. The second sentence, how do we allow, should be for, not form. <coughs> insert the word to between access and student. And on the last, line learning and more communication to family members um, and that is it okay are there any other comments about the minutes or corrections okay the minutes um, so amended all, all in favor of the minutes as so amended aye, aye. aye. any opposed any abstentions? Okay, Mr. Hainer is abstaining. Um, and I note that these minutes are the minutes of the eval superintendent's evaluation that was held on November 15th, 2012. And they include lots of attachments, mm -hmm. which were the other written evaluations. So, okay, so the minutes pass. Have those. And now I have lost my agenda. Secretary's report. Yeah, Thank you. you. Secretary's report. Okay, and um, this is a longer one because I was out and, um, and then catching up. So under letters, we have a copy of a letter from Laurie Welch Storch, Principal of Fulton Avenue School, number eight, dated February 2013. A letter from Elizabeth Warren, United States Senator, dated February 13, 2013. Arlington Public Schools announces high school principal from Kathleen Bodie, dated February 25, 2013. Copy of the letter to Diane Johnson, mm -hmm. Chief Financial Officer of Arlington Public Schools from Ms. Janice A. Bakey, Clerk of the Martin Luther King Jr. Birthday Observation Committee, dated February 25, 2013, letter regarding request for presentation on common assessments from Laura Chesson, Assistant Superintendent of Arlington Public Schools, dated February 26, 2013, copy of a letter to um, Marilyn Petito Devaney from Rosario Cascio, President of the Pirodello Lyceum, dated March 1, 2013, 
copy of amendment memorandum regarding election of school committee officers to Karen Fitzgerald from Kearsey, Allison Ampey, MD, dated March 4th, 2013. Copy of a letter to Ms. Janice A. Bakey, clerk of the Martin Luther King Jr. Birthday Observance Committee from Kathleen Bodie, EDD, Superintendent of Schools, dated March 5th, 2013. Letter from Mary Jo Rossetti, President of Massachusetts Association of School Committees, dated March 19th, 2013. Copy of a brochure for color collision at Clark Gallery from April 9th to May 11th, 2013. Emails. Winter sports update from Mary Villano, dated February 23rd, 2013. Assistant Coach of the Year from Robert Bartholomew, dated February 25th, 2013. Lions Club Speech Contest, Arlington Takes It from Lauren Schultz, dated February 25, 2013. Congratulations to Stacy and welcome to Terry from William McCarthy, Assistant Principal Arlington High School, dated February 26, 2013. Mecca Lobby Day Reminder from Kathleen Bodie, dated March 2, 2013. National History Day excuse me, national, not natural. National History Day regional competition results from Carrie Dunn dated March 4th, 2013. BDAA election of school committee officers from Bill Hayner dated March 5th, 2013. My willingness to become chair from Judson Pierce dated March 6, 2013. School committee communication from Kathleen Lockyer, interim director of special education, Arlington Public Schools dated March 14, 2013. Exciting news from Ruth Dunn, APS Daycare, dated March 14, 2013. Prodigious achievement from Dennis Geller, PhD, Mathematics and Computer Science, dated March 15, 2013. Invitation to town event with Jim Wallace from Brian Emmett, Pastor Covenant Church, Arlington, dated March 26, 2013. Other documents. Final HIPAA regulations requiring action by covered entities and business associates. Labor and Employment Alert from Murphy, Hess, Toomey, and Lahane, LLP, dated February 2013. Massachusetts Department of Education issues guidance on gender identity law. Education Alert from Murphy, Hess, Toomey, and Lahane, LLP, dated February 2013, 2013 Annual Town Meeting Articles, Select and Hearings, packet containing the following from M Massachusetts Association of School Committees, Inc., dated March 1, 2013, Official Notice of the 2013 Delegate Assembly, a nomination form for election, resolutions form, nomination forms for life membership, lifetime achievement recognition, and the 2013 All-State School Committee and MASC Committees. Ponder Report, Arlington, Massachusetts, March 2013 issue, Arlington Community Education, Summer Fund 2013 brochure, Arlington Community Education, Spring 2013 brochure, Arlington Community Education, Kids Zone, Spring 2013 brochure, the Arlington Public School Visual Arts Department Announcement 2013, AEF Trivia B Program, dated March 24, 2013. Thank you. Okay. And at this point, we go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect to conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Right, I need this one. Um, uh, collective bargaining may also be conducted. Update on superintendent contract negotiations. Update on Kathleen Bodie, uh, ED superintendent's contract. And we will be exiting only for the purposes of adjournment. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Aye. 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 And with oh. that, we go into executive session. Thank you all for watching. Jeff.